What is up? How's it going? All right. Today we're going to do a little bit of development on some vectorized emulation stuff. Uh, if you're not familiar, vectorized emulation is is probably my best fuzzing research I've ever done. Um, it's extremely high performance emulation, kind of with the goal of fuzzing and getting kind of that feedback in a fast way. Quick resets, good feedback, good fidelity on memory accesses, uh, kind of some solving stuff, just all of the all of the magical things that go into kind of the high-end uh, fuzzing stuff. Uh, I have a couple things I just need to clean up and polish on this. So basically, I'm going to go through and do some of those things. While that sounds really boring, they're actually really interesting and very, very technical problems. Um, so I'm really excited to kind of hop in here and, and start getting some of these, uh, written. So we're going to go into, uh, soft, ser soft serve, which is actually really hard to say. Uh, we're going to go into soft serve and that's the name of the current emulator that I've been working on. Um, it's not complete yet. It's pretty far from that. I actually haven't gotten code execution, uh, inside of this new emulator yet. Um, so that's going to be basically the goal for this stream is to get uh, some new JIT running up in this code. So I'm going to blast out some tweets. I think my the my initial tweet was uh, kind of lackluster in terms of uh, selling how cool this stream's going to be. So I'm going to we're just going to delete that tweet and uh, make a new one. <laughs> let me uh, let me see what I can find here. I don't even know how to use this site. All right. Yep. Okay. And just need to grab this link and we'll put this up. Sorry about this. Okay. All right. So where are we at right now? Um, I'm actually not 100% sure. Let me uh, let me see kind of how everything's looking. So I've been I've been kind of looking at this SHA-2 test uh, today, which I just wrote up, and it's basically a, a small um, it's kind of a small use of SHA-2. I took an application which I, I should have archived. So I wrote a little application. Well, I stole someone's implementation of SHA-256. Um, and then all I did is I put like a little wrapper around it, uh, foop.c file, in which case I just do a SHA-256 of the string ASDF, which is four bytes, and then that generates the 32-byte hash. Uh, and I just do that in a loop. So mainly what I want to do is some benchmarking of this sort of stuff. Uh, SHA-2 actually hits a pretty complex instruction in MIPS that I don't necessarily want to implement a lifter for today. Obviously, it's not too difficult. It's like a one or two hour task. Uh, but spending one or two hours on one instruction uh, can get really boring. So what I think I might actually do is look into uh, writing a 6502 lifter. I've never worked this 6502 before. I'm not really familiar with it. And I would love to kind of start learning kind of how that works and the basics of that. So let's get this uh, Ida VM it up here and I'll kind of show you roughly the state everything is in so I'm gonna have to add a couple instructions to my intermediate language uh, I've got a couple optimization passes that I want to implement uh, pretty soon here and I also want to okay let's see um, and I also want to just kind of get the JIT up and running because I because I haven't gotten that working yet so effectively, this is the little, uh, that's the SHA function. So if I go to main in this application, it's just standard MIPS. Uh, in this case, it's uh, little endian 64-bit MIPS. And this is kind of the, the main function that, that we get here. Now, what I do is I lift this MIPS into my IL, which I should be able to render with Binary Ninja. So let's take a look at what my aisle looks like. So if I open up this, uh, this is not technically correct yet, so we're not going to look too much at the assembly. But we can kind of look side by side if this behaves. 
um, to what my IL looks like compared to the, the underlying MIPS. So in this case, we can see we're taking or grabbing the stack pointer, we're subtracting 40 from it, and we're storing that back into the stack. So we're allocating 40 hex bytes on the stack. Nothing, nothing out of the ordinary here. And if we look at kind of how this looks in my IL, we see that I load up this constant, which is negative 40, but it's the uh, it's kind of the opposite version. So in MIPS, you can't. These are it's technically an add operation. So I don't actually. Uh, in my IL, I represent it as an add, as a wrapping add. Um, so here I load up that negative 40 constant. I grab the target 29 register, which is the SP register. I put that into ILR1. I then take ILR1 and I add it with ILR0, which is that uh, constant, the negative, or the, yeah, the negative 40. That will cause that wrapping addition to occur. And now, uh, that result is put into ILR2, which I store right back out into the 29th target register. So basically these four IL instructions represent this one uh, MIPS instruction. And we can take a look at uh, another one. So this uh, store D word here, um, or store double word in this case, which is a 64-bit. It's important to recognize that since we're working on MIPS right now, a word is 32 bits and a double word is actually 64 bits compared to x86 and the Windows conventions that we're used to where a, a word is 16 bits and a double word is 64 bits. MIPS is actually a little bit more correct architecturally by calling them those things. Um, so we're just going to be a little bit careful with those. In my IL, I actually explicitly go by the bit size rather than saying words and double words because it's just... It's, it's dangerous, it's confusing. So here we'll see once again, we're gonna grab uh, a 30 constant, which is this instruction here. We're gonna take target 29, which is the SP register. We're gonna add the target 29 SP plus 30 hex. And then we're going to, uh, looks like we're gonna grab target 28 which is, actually, is this right? Um, yes, it is right. So this is a store uh, double word. So this is taking the GP register, and this is storing the contents of the 64-bit GP register into this location on the stack. Um, and we can see here, we're taking uh, SP, we're adding 30 hex to it, we're grabbing the value of the 28th register, which is the GP register, and then we're writing to the location at the address in ILR5, which was that added operation, we're writing the ILR6 value. So in this case, it's a, uh, um, in this case, ILR6 is the GP register. So that looks fine and dandy as well. So it's important to note that this MIPS uh, emulator is not necessarily like or the MIPS lifter is not quite done yet. Um, so it's just, there's probably gonna be bugs here. I'm planning on eventually implementing and, and kind of redoing some of these things. Ida Pro, we got Ida and Binja up today. We got a, we got a mix of everything you need here. We can even bring up Ghidra if you want. No, no fan clubs here. We'll use all the tools that, that suit our needs today. So if we take a look at this one, this load upper immediate instruction, this is actually going to store into the top 16 bits of the 32-bit low part of the GP register. It's going to store an A. And if we look at RIL, it actually is a lot cleaner. Here we're grabbing the... Um, here we're grabbing... Exactly that. So we have an A in the top 16 bits, and then we're just going to store this right out into target 28, which is the GP register. And we just kind of go on and so on and so forth. This is effectively what the IL looks like for this corresponding uh, MIPS. We need Windbag to make it the best stream. Oh, how do how do we do that? So I I don't I don't think opening Windbag is fair. That's kind of cheating. So we could go into like here and we could go into like here. Uh, and let's see if this, uh, we'll just open up calculator. Oh, we don't, oh, there you go. There's uh, there's windbag popping up due to a, a crash in calc. <laughs> so there you go, there's, there's your windbag. That's a, that's a good crash too. That's a, that's a really nice address there. 
Um, this is actually the uh, uh, type confusion bug that we reproed on, uh, on another stream, or root caused more specifically. So then if we kind of look down at the rest of what this uh, looks like, here we have a, um, actually that probably shouldn't be a branch indirect. No, maybe this is right. Uh, I just implemented this today. I, I think there's a good chance that this is probably a little broken. Um, branch if not equal. Yeah, this doesn't look quite right, but that's not a big deal. Today, we're not really focusing on the lifter. I know this lifter is really broken. This lifter is literally just to like lift enough IL stuff so I can test kind of things in my IL. I'm not really looking for parity with MIPS right now. Uh, that will come later once I've fleshed out kind of the design and implementation of this IL. Noob question, what is vectorized emulation? So vectorized emulation, uh, wow, it, it, it's, uh, so I have a couple blogs on it, and I will link those blogs right now. Um, I should probably bookmark this link so it's easier to pull up. So I have two different blogs on vectorized emulation. Uh, there's the first one, that's kind of an introduction, and then I have a second one, which is kind of details of how I, how I handle memory in that environment. Now, uh, vectorized emulation is really, really, really complex. Um, it is very advanced, like, uh, optimization and compiler and, and fuzzing work. Um, but effectively what I do is I lift any architecture. I don't care what architecture it is. I lift that architecture. Let's say it's MIPS in this case. I lift that into my IL. And then what I do is I actually JIT out for x86. I JIT out vector versions of this IL. And uh, vector registers, if you're not familiar, those are kind of like the SSE instruction set. So on x86, they go through a bunch of different versions. So they originally started with um, something called MMX way back in like 94 or 95. They went to SSE, then they introduced AVX, and then finally they added like AVX2 was kind of just a, a an improvement on AVX, and then AVX512 came out. Um, and basically these vector registers allow you to pull up paint and make really shitty diagrams. So a vector register effectively will look something like this, and we're just gonna put like four little blocks here and let's say this vector register, we're gonna call this XMM0, which is an actual name of a vector register on x86, and Paint is not being nice to me today. So we have XMM0 here, and XMM0, XMM registers, this is a 128-bit register. And what that means is that that 128-bit register, if we, if we do the math, and we say, I want to hold 32-bit values. We can take 128 bits, and we can divide it by 32, and we'll see that we get four different values. It means that one 128-bit register can hold, uh, can hold four 32-bit registers, or more specifically, hold four 32-bit values is, is a better way to say it. So these values um, are just numbers, and they're just 32-bit numbers, whatever you want them to be. And we're gonna call these guys, we're gonna call the, like an individual part of this vector, we're gonna call this a lane. And uh, so let's do the whole thing. So here, this whole thing, we're gonna call a vector register. And then the individual component, we're gonna call a lane. And this 128-bit register can hold four of these 32-bit values, which, okay, well, what's the point of that? Well, what this allows you to do is this allows you to um, perform mathematical operations with a single instruction on multiple pieces of data. And they call this SIMD for single instruction, multiple data, exactly for that reason. So if we take a look at like an actual x86 instruction, we'll say packed add D words into XMM0 of XMM0. So what this is going to do is this is going to add the XMM0 register with, the, with itself, and then it's going to store that back out into the XMM0 register. So if we take a look, this is effectively going to do a, a plus here, 
So we're gonna we're gonna add these two things together, and then the resulting register that we get out of this will be something like, uh, hey, thanks for the bits. Thank you. I think those are the first bits I've ever had in this stream. That's a uh, look at that moving up in the world. So. After doing this packed add instruction, this single x86 instruction, we'll get a result which will be 10, 12, 2, and 4. Effectively, all of these things will be added together in parallel. But it doesn't matter uh, what the contents of these things are. They don't have to be the same in all the registers. So let's say that somehow this is a, um, let's say instead of a 0, this is a, a, a 1. And we'll we'll clean this up uh, yep, for, for whatever... Uh, version of clean this is look at that all right so that means we could have like a different value in here we could have 15 in here and what this will do is it's just performing an add on all of these as individual uh as individual values and what effectively that allows you to do is dramatically reduce the amount of um instructions that you have and you're doing like all these things kind of in parallel and gpus do this to like a much 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 wider extent um but we'll go a little bit into why we can't do gpus later um skip Witch, thank you for subscribing welcome to the club welcome to the party all right I watch ads just for donating. How does that work? You can watch ads and that allows you to uh, to like donate. That's really cool. Huh. Uh, will this stuff help with learning Vuln research? I think just being around in this stream, you'll get little tidbits of knowledge here and there. But vectorized emulation itself is not going to be the most approachable thing. Um, but just ask questions. Ask questions and I'll answer questions. And then that will hopefully get us kind of in the right mindset to, to answer and learn different things. Because here we're about learning and experiencing things and, and reaching out. So feel free to ask whatever, whatever questions you have. So is that a good example of kind of what these vector registers are and how these sorts of things kind of work? I don't know if this is if this has been confusing or not, I can kind of go a little bit more into the details of uh, these kind of vector registers and stuff. Uh, how do I how do I approach kernel exploit development? Use after freeze, double freeze, all that complicated stuff. Um, I'm stuck learning just basic stack stuff, bypassing ASLR, DEP, SEH, and ex uh, eggs, etc. I don't know if eggs. I I'm not I'm not familiar with something called eggs. Egg hunters. Oh, I'm yeah. I I don't know what that is. Um. So if you want to get into kernel exploit development, that's first of all I would say start off with Linux because Linux kernel exploits are a lot easier than Windows kernel exploits. First of all, you have source. You have access to better symbols. You can recompile it, and you can kind of go through and learn. Um, a little bit more about how things work. So one of the first things that you'll end up doing, all of the things that you mentioned, use after free and double free, is all relate to heap-related bugs. And when you're dealing with heap-related bugs, you usually need a pretty good understanding of exactly how uh, allocators in general work, but more specifically, how the allocator you're targeting works. So in the case of Linux, you have like three different kernel allocators. You have the slab allocator, not to be confused with slab style allocators. There's explicitly one called the slab allocator, like slab.c. There's a slub allocator, which is a little bit more rare. Um, or actually slub, I think, is the one that everyone's using right now. And then you have the slob allocator. And they're all slightly different. Some are for uh, more performance, some are for more memory constrained systems, more embedded systems, and they all have their place. But effectively, your kernel is typically compiled with one of those allocators in place, and when you're writing an exploit against that target, you need to understand specifically how the allocator that you are working against is implemented. So the first thing I would do if you're trying to learn those things is learn how the allocators work. You can find good talks on it. So like if you if you just Googled and you know there's a chance this fails, but uh, Linux slob allocator of slides, 
let's see and here we go we have like some slides on some presentation going through the different allocators in the kernel and and kind of the the benefits of, of them you know cash friendliness all these things so, so you'll find slub is kind of the most common one you see around um but you can find stuff like this that will kind of show visually what a heap looks like um when you're yeah, and this is actually really well detailed here, kind of going into all of the different uh, structures that are involved in that cache or in that heap. And it kind of shows you like all of the different parts and how they line up and how things look when they're freed and how padding is and and all this stuff, coloring if you have it and red zones and blah, 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 blah. But understanding all of this very thoroughly uh, is pretty much required for exploiting use after freeze or those sorts of bugs effectively so in the public you'll find a lot of people will do like sprays where they'll like spray the shit out of the heap and then they'll try to like pick up the right object spraying is never a good way to write an exploit if you're ever if you ever find yourself writing a spray in an exploit you're probably doing something wrong or your bug is probably not as good of a bug as you could get um, obviously sometimes it's hard to go get a better bug but if you're going against something like the Linux kernel, you can always just find another bug. Like you don't, you don't have to commit to weaponizing a bug that is very difficult to work with. Um, I'm starting with Windows, uh, reading the Windows internals books. Um, Hacks this extreme vulnerable driver. Yeah, it's a good way to start. Uh, with Windows, it's a little bit more difficult. You still have some symbols on those structures. The Windows kernel structures for heaps are relatively well documented. You can find talks on them all over the place. You can find blogs all over the place. They do change a lot more frequently than the Linux uh, heaps do. So you'll find that there's a big difference between Windows 7, Windows 8, and Windows 10 heaps, namely the low fragmentation heap, which I know is in user space and I think is used in the kernel as well, uh, at least in Windows 10, but it wasn't until recently. Uh, what is currently the best way to get, so that's, first of all, really hard to answer what is the best way to do something, because typically there's never a best way generically. There's a best way for your target, but there's usually never a best way for specifically, or for generically what you want to do. But nevertheless, uh, what is the best way to gather coverage on latest Windows 10 64-bit and do coverage-based fuzzing? Also, for example, using Box to emulate and fuzz Windows, how do you catch kernel panics? I know KFL hooks bug check functions in the guest VM to catch a kernel crash. Are there other ways? Okay, so first of all, to answer the first part of that question of like how you go about coverage-based fuzzing on Windows 10 64-bit. If you're doing kernel land fuzzing, which I, given the last part of your question, I'm just assuming that you might be, if you're doing kernel level fuzzing, you don't really have many options except for an emulator. Um, yes, you can try to do some crazy things where you like take a, an existing binary and you lift it and then you re-emit it and you add instrumentation to all the blocks. That is very difficult and provably an impossible problem to solve. You can maybe approximate it and get everything that you need out of it, um, but it's it, it's impossible. It's impossible to like do that static kind of lifting and translation. So I usually stray away from that and go more into an emulation route. Um, that being said, if you're using, if you're doing uh, user land things or you're working with an open source driver or utility or something in the kernel that you can compile, um, then of course you can add instrumentation using Clang or MSVC. Um, actually, MSVC, I don't think, has a way of adding instrumentation. Um, they just added ASAN. I don't know if it's publicly accessible to, like, add instrumentation in there. Um, but effectively, that's kind of kind of what you can do there. Uh, I know KFL hooks the bug check function and the guest VM. Are there other ways? So there are a couple ways that you can catch uh, exceptions in those things generically. If you have an emulator, you can actually hook the exceptions themselves as they get delivered. But for things that are OS level constructs and KE bug checked, like a, a kernel panic and a blue screen are operating system level constructs. So those do require that you explicitly put a breakpoint or have some sort of enlightenment into your target such that you can hook those things. Um, 
obviously you can see all of the exceptions and you'll likely see the reason it happened. Like you'll see the page fault that happened and then a while later it doesn't get handled, it doesn't get paged in from disk, and then eventually it actually goes to KE bug check. Um, but there are also situations where you would never see an exception. For example, an assert might directly invoke KE bug check as a function even though no exception ever actually occurred that caused it to take that path. Um, so there can be a, a couple difficulties uh, there. But ultimately, emulation is probably the easiest way to go uh, if you're trying to get that coverage information. QMU will get you pretty much close to native execution speeds. It's maybe like a maybe like a 5 to 10x slowdown, which is like whoop de doo who cares? Um, Box is going to be like 100x slowdown, 50 to 100x slowdown, but you it's easier to write instrumentation for, the code's cleaner, uh, things, you don't have to worry about an IL where you have to worry about like intermediate states and registers being held in temporaries and not flushed to the actual architectural state. Um, so I do recommend Box for that kind of an environment. Um, yeah, if you're doing syscall fuzzing, you're pretty much going to be stuck in an emulator. Uh, you could potentially um, set up a driver in the kernel that would like randomly interrupt things and you could maybe peek at the interrupt stack and you could do like timer and um, interrupt based sampling of where code has been hit. Obviously it's not perfect and I know that sounds like a terrible idea um, but that like I've used that many times and it's usually good enough. It's usually plenty good enough for anything you need. Set up a timer that trips a thousand or ten thousand times a second, record where you are currently executing when that timer fired and congratulations, you have coverage in a very generic way that has no limitations on dependencies of the kernel or how things look or all these things. You can make things really clean in that environment, which is nice. Um, oh, geez, Sim. Yeah, you walked into a SIMD stream. Welcome. How's it going, George? How are you doing today? My 20-year-old calculator, if it crashes for whatever reason, uh, even an explicit user-initiated warm boot or warm start upon reboot gives a reason why it rebooted. My modern computer? I don't know. Well, you kind of have that with, like, Windows Server, I guess, where you have to have, like, the shutdown reasons. But, yeah, that's not... Uh... <laughs> I mean, that's just a, f that's a fancy, fancy calculator. I'm guessing an HP calculator. That's your 48G. Oh, you mean for a crash. Okay. Okay. An ungraceful reboot. You can find that in, like, uh, event logs, at least on, on Windows. Um, or, like, last K message on a lot of Android phones. I don't think they have that on, like, normal Linux systems. But last K message on Android phones is actually really nice. It, it's literally just, like the most recent couple thousand lines from D message, which is really cool. Um, I already went through the userland uh, fuzz security and Coraline's tutorials. I'm up to the classic browser heap spraying tutorials uh, part seven or so, but next we'll be going through the Vuln driver I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Uh, oops, I missed the first one. I would start with Coraline uh, tutorials and learn userland stuff. Okay, that's how I learned Windows kernel exploits as I first started in userland. And I learned those exploits well and moved on to kernel mode. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So that was a, a very brief intro to kind of what SIMD looks like. Um, but effectively what I do, and I'm going to keep that, you know, I'll save this as like simd.png. Um, so effectively I take this MIPS or any any target architecture, I lift this into my IL, which is visualized here in Binary Ninja, and then that gets JIT out to AVX512 uh, as a JIT here. So here we can see the equivalent of this, which I don't think there's a way that you can break out the window in Binja. I've been asking for that. Um, let's see, uh, split to new window, new window for tab, like that. New window for tab sounds exactly like what I want, but it, for some reason it doesn't work on those uh, sorts of windows. So we'll just open this up again, and we'll just do this. So if we look kind of side by side, uh, this is the IL here, and on the left side we have the JIT, the JITted output. And there are a lot of optimizations that I need to add to this. 
Um, and obviously you see a lot of memory accesses and we can get rid of a lot of these pretty soon. Um, but effectively, like here, if we if we look, the instruction start is just a marker that's maintained inside of the aisle itself to tell you how where things line up with the actual architecture. Obviously, after enough optimization passes, things get moved around, um, and these never actually get jitted out. Now, it can be useful here because this is the instruction starts is where I would put my coverage information. That's where I would log. Um, that's where I would end up logging all the PCs that I've seen. So my coverage would go in here, and that would actually be self-modifying code. Basically, that self-modifying code would add this entry into a database, and then once it's added that entry, it will actually remove itself in code such that there's no, more, there's no longer a performance cost to gathering that coverage information. Um, obviously, self-modifying code can be really dangerous for uh, performance, but in this case, it's, it's not a big deal. So, and that means every single instruction has its own little block where it's updating this database and it can just purge itself once it is no longer needed. And then the, the cost goes down to zero with the exception of the tiny amount of overhead uh, due to the iCache pollution of having larger code. And once the whole function gets covered or a, a full block gets covered, I can actually go through and remove all of that instrumentation kind of in post. I can replace the jitted block. Um, but yeah, if we look at kind of the JIT for this right now, here we see like we're loading up this constant into ILR0. Here we see that ILR0 has been allocated at uh, ZMM29, and we're loading up that constant here. So it's a memory access. You can't actually see this constant, but uh, this is the fastest way that you can load a constant value in AVX512 on Knight's Landing. So this is this is what I do. Um, then the next thing we see is we're loading uh, an IL register, or we're loading a target register into an IL register. Here we see that ILR1 is allocated to ZMM28, and we see that we have uh, R12 plus 740. And if we do the math on 740, we should find that. Uh, do, 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 do. If we do 740 divided by uh, 40, we'll see this is 1D, so it's target register 29. Basically, uh, R12 points to all of the um, target registers in memory. And then that's loaded into CMM28. We perform the addition. Technically, this uh, uh, broadcast could actually be the final operand here, and that would omit an, an instruction. But it's actually really difficult in an IL to be aware that the underlying code that you're going to JIT to is capable of having certain arguments be memory and others not. So I would have to have my IL know to hold off loading this immediate because later in the JIT sequence, I could actually use that, I could load that immediate in the same instruction that the ad is being performed in. Um, this is an optimization pass that will probably take a day to write when I finally get to it, and that will be a big cleanup to some of our code, but it's not a huge issue. What else do we have? So that's the addition of the two. Everything looks good. And then at the end, we write back out to the 740. So we're updating that SP register um, with ZMM28. So this is kind of how everything looks at this level. Uh, it's nothing too fancy or too crazy. Um, it's pretty literal right now for that translation. And there are a couple optimizations that I'm going to want to do. So you can see that we're ac anywhere that we're accessing R12 right now are target register accesses. And we can see that it's about half of all of our jitted instructions right now. So what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to write an IL pass, um, an optimization pass on my IL that will kind of track the lifetimes of these. So it would know that currently target 29 is loaded in ILR1. This would no longer have to update target 29 except for some internal metadata saying that now target or ILR2 is who holds 20, or target 29. And that would allow me to kind of omit a lot of these, uh, a lot of these kind of loads and stores from memory, which are really, really expensive, uh, especially on the Xeon Phi. So if we imagine this code without any of these R12 accesses, we would have probably a 50% reduction in instructions, which would be basically a doubling of performance. So that is a direction that I will want to be heading uh, relatively soon. And, but yeah, that's kind of everything lifted up here. Um, 
I don't actually have the, the memory loads and stores implemented in the JIT right now, so they just don't even show up in the JIT at all, so it kind of looks silly. Um, uh, nor do I have branch indirect implemented. Once again, these are all like one hour things that I just need to get to. Um, but yeah, that's effectively kind of how that looks. So what I'm going to want to do is, first of all, I want to get my JIT up and running. And to do that, I need to set up the right context to run this JIT. I have a very, very special calling convention for this JIT. And effectively, what I want to do is I want to make sure that my JIT runs... Uh, whatever code, I, I don't care what it is, I want my JIT to run uh, code in the exact same way as my emulator. So I also have an emulator for my IL that allows me to just kind of emulate all of these things. Um, and it's written really slow. I don't have a register allocator. Everything's just actually like a big vector of the number of IL registers you have. And the goal of that is for verification. It's meant to be very simple, very easy to test, very easy to implement. And what I want to do is I want to get my JIT up and running today. And I want to do some comparisons with the IL uh, state. And if that goes really well, then we'll probably write that um, this uh, register read and write optimization pass because that is currently going to be kind of our biggest issue in the JIT. Although this JIT is, is actually looking pretty good um, for the, the quality if you ignore a lot of the loads and stores to, uh, to this, this R12 memory. So, but yeah, other than that, everything looks pretty solid. The, all of like the arithmetic, all of the register allocation looks pristine. I'm really happy with this register allocation. So like here we're loading a target register, we're using it as an operand, and then we know that we never use that uh, IL register again, so we can actually use that as the storage for the result of this operation, which is really, really cool. Uh, I love seeing that. Um, this code gen here looks really nice. Uh, yep, that's performing an add, and then it's sign extending it. It's doing a 32-bit sign extension here, which is the fastest way that we can do a 32-bit sign extension um, in AVX 512. So... Yeah, we've got a lot of cool things like that. So that's kind of where we are currently. We're just not able to execute this JIT right now because we don't jump into it at all. So what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to make a contrived uh, implementation of... Um, we're going to go into another test I have that we manually we write in an IL. I don't want to do this really on the MIPS stuff yet because the MIPS lifter is really broken. Um, and I just don't want to like have a chance of kind of ending up doing things wrong because we're looking in that uh, environment. So we'll go into soft serve, and then I think I have like an IL bench. Yes, I do. And here I should be able to do a cargo run release. Do do. I need to get rid of these third party depths. I don't have thirty third party depths anymore. Um, I switched to a different procedural macro. Okay, and then let's get rid of these uh, warnings and errors in uh, these things quick, because I really, I really need to see uh, warnings here, because sometimes they'll be able to tell you uh, when things are going wrong. So we'll look at Ilograph, we'll look at the JIT, and we just have a MemBC import here that's not being used. We'll comment that out because I know eventually we're going to use that. And we have a CSBC macro here that is not being used. Once again, comment it out because I know that's going to get used. Um, and then the next things is in the actual MIPS lifter, folk IL MIPS. We've got a couple things here, uh, 229 RRS and RRT are not being used. And the false target address doesn't need to be mutable, of course not. And 105, this doesn't need to be part of the enum. And hopefully, cargo clean. Let's just see if that gets us building everything. And I think it will. And I don't know why I have uh, that window open. Okay. Cool, 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 cool. Okay, um... Okay, that was not found. Yeah, we're going to go into whistle here and build it here. So I've been doing most of this dev uh, in whistle. 
Um, this code runs both on, on Windows and Linux, but I've been mainly doing the dev on Linux because that's uh, closer to kind of the environment that I plan to run in. So let's see. If I look at I'll bench source. So here's kind of the test application that we're running right now. So uh, basically, I'm saying I want a new aisle session. I want to use a test VM. That's the type of the VM. So this is where you would put in like MIPS VM or like x86 VM. And this allows you to switch out what backs uh, this environment. So um, basically, you can change the architecture there. I set up a callback for the creation of the master VM. That's responsible for kind of creating the initial state of the VM, the fuzz callback, which gets called every fuzz case, coverage callback, which gets called on coverage events, uh, the number of threads that I want to use when fuzzing, and then finally, start, when I want to uh, say, let's get going. And so what you'll see is this test VM structure here. We actually implement this uh, directly in this file. So typically, this will be implemented for you in some uh, you know, actual lifter for an architecture. But in this case, uh, we're implementing one manually so we get a little bit more control. So here are our fake, um, our fake, uh, what do we wanna call this? Our, our fake uh, architecture has two registers. It has an A register and a PC register. I just made some conversion stuff that allows us to convert back and forth between uh, this and the target reg. And then here where I'm defining kind of what the shape of this architecture is, I say, here's what a register looks like. So this is the type that is used for a register. I say that this is the PC register value. So um, this allows the internals of the tool to know kind of where current execution is, uh, the maximum register value that sets kind of the size of the register bank that needs to be allocated for this VM. And here I just create a new VM. In this case, test VM actually doesn't have any state. So that doesn't have to do anything. And then finally, uh, what happens is we'll see the lift uh, function will get called. So in this case, if I do print um, requesting a lifting of uh, this. So what this is going to do is it's going to print out the PC that's uh, requested to lift. And then down here, we're just going to put this panic right back in. Um, Yep, lower hex not found because it's a virtual address. And let's see. So here it says requesting a lifting of that. Well, what I'm going to do quickly is I'm going to actually um, set this context. So I'm going to do uh, VM. Oops. We're going to do VM dot set regs uh, online register PC to OX leap. So this would allow me to like set that PC register and let me get online. Uh, online is equal to vm.online. That gets basically all of the VMs that are online set regs expected to uh, set reg I think is, yeah. So all I've done is when we create this master VM, instead of actually um, doing nothing like before, here I'm setting up a register and I'm saying that the PC register should start at leet. Um, and then that means that when I go to emulate and execute, you don't actually see any of that code. It just automatically knows it has to start emulating this stuff under the hood. And that will cause lift to get invoked whenever there is a block or whenever there's a function that's hit that has never been lifted before. Basically, uh, all under the hood, it will request, hey, could you please lift uh, at this PC, here's your MMU and here's your uh, VM state, uh, please um, generate me a graph. Or if you can't generate me a graph, give me an error of why you couldn't lift a graph. So here we're kind of creating this fake graph. In this case, we're, um, we're gonna make, uh, we're gonna grab uh, 1024 load constant 1024. So we're gonna load a constant of 1024 we're going to allocate a block, which is going to be the ending block. We're going to allocate, uh, we're going to call this like the loop block. In this case, oops, we'll keep it as the left block then. And what I'm going to do is directly after loading this immediate, I'm going to branch to this left block. And then what I do in my IL is I push label left. This means I'm now editing the left node in the graph. Um, and here I'm going to fill it in with a, uh, I'm going to load the A register. I'm going to grab an immediate one. I'm going to add 
it, from the, the A register, I'm going to add one to that A register, and then I'm going to write that value back out to the, um, to the A register. And then finally, I'm going to do a conditional branch. So I'm going to say, if the result is unsigned less than 1024, we want to go to the left block, which is looping back up. Otherwise, let's jump to the end block. And then finally, at the end, we just establish this end block. And I know I don't pop label. I just don't have to because I'm not actually using the stack in this case. Um, so here I say I'm going to edit the end block. And the end block is just going to trap. It's just going to fail. It's basically like an int3 uh, to signify that we're kind of done with this run. And then we're going to optimize the graph. We're going to validate the graph to make sure that we don't violate any of the um, SSA form requirements. Uh, this register allocation I shouldn't need to do. I had that there before for testing. Um, uh, 84 here. I just need a semi that I deleted. Whoa. There we go. So here we get our panic at stop, which is good. We see that we dumped to binary ninja, and then we also jitted out all of this stuff. And that looks good. So if we take a look in Binja, we can... Uh, pop this graph open again, and this is what we just wrote kind of manually. So we load up this 1024, we branch to block 2, and then in block 2, we grab target 0, we add 1 to it, we restore it back to target 0. We're going to say if the result of that is less than 1024, then we're going to go back to block 2. Otherwise, we'll jump to the ending block, which is dead. So um, sometimes I do a lot of work by writing the aisle directly. Uh, this means that when I don't have everything implemented yet in my, um, when I don't have everything yet implemented in my, uh, uh, JIT, for example, I don't have my memory writes yet implemented. I don't have my indirect branches, which is basically any return, uh, or call. I don't have those implemented yet in my JIT. So this allows me to kind of work with what I have now and try to see if there's anything I can do here to speed it up. So if I were to go and instead of panic, if I were to let this run, we'll actually see that it will go through and emulate this. And target zero will start at zero, and then it will go up to that 1024. So here we see kind of going through all of these things, we see this repeat a bunch, and then finally we hit a, a trap of dead. And if I just put this to like a log file here, uh, looks good. It's not going to let me open gvim there, so I do need one other terminal open. CD dev soft serve uh, IL bench. We'll open up this log file here. And what I should be able to do is I can delete lines not containing add. Oops. Delete lines not containing add. And here we see 1,024 adds. So we, we went through this loop, 1,024 iterations before finally exiting out of the loop. So effectively what I want to do now is I want to get this working with the JIT. So if we take a look at the JIT that this generated um, in assembly bin, uh, is that uh, we want to put this at uh, mount D assembly bin. It's like, why? That, that looks so huge for, for what we have. Okay, so now hop in here. And this is the JIT that we got from that. So we, we ended up lifting, or we ended up writing this IL, and then the JIT that we emit here is pretty lightweight. This is about as lightweight as we can possibly get it, with the exception of uh, we could move this, uh, we could move the loading of target zero to a dominator, and we could move the storing, the updating of target zero to a post dominator. That's another optimization pass that I really want to implement. Uh, but that's that's actually really, really difficult to implement. I need to, right now I don't actually have post dominators in my graph. Uh, I only have dominators. So to do post dominators, I would have to find all like dead ended nodes because uh, the post dominators would vary based on the exit nodes of your graph. So I think what I would do is I'd probably end up adding an exit node for, for the graph and everything would always exit out through one path. And that means everything would start with one node and everything would end with one node. Um, so like here, it looks really obvious, but if there were two different exit paths, uh, figuring out kind of all the control flow there can get really complicated. Um, obviously it's a solvable problem, but, uh, 
I just kind of want to avoid some of those things. So I think what I'll end up doing is I'll probably end up having a, a, a post dominator for everything. So, um, and that's something that I could implement relatively easily. I think, uh, I just have to search through all nodes that finish without a branch and then they would all jump to a, a post dominator. Even if they don't use that, uh, post dominator, that would be, that would be fine. It would just allow me to do the traversals correctly, which would be good. Okay. So basically this JIT actually looks really good. I'm happy with this. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and set up the environment to get this JIT to run. Um, and to do this, I need to look at the calling conventions of my JIT and I need to set up like a trampoline. It's going to look a lot like uh, OS development, like a context switch between threads or processes. So if I look at the calling convention for the JIT, we'll see that this is basically the, the state. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's literally just written in comments right now. Um, but R8 points to some 64-byte aligned scratch memory. R9 points to the root page table. Uh, R10 points to all of the IL register banks, which I don't think we're using right now. We're not. Um, we would probably use this if we have some spillage. Right now, I don't support spilling at all of uh, registers, so don't worry about that. Uh, this points to the constant storage table. If we take a look at the JIT, we'll see that when it loads a constant, it's accessing this constant storage table. Um, R12 points to 64-byte aligned target registers. Once again, if we look at that, when it accesses a target register, it's accessing in this R12 bank. And then finally, we have the fast, dirty list and the fast, dirty remaining free entries, uh, which um, basically this is a pointer to a vector of, I think, U64s. So I'm going to have to go check that in the MMU. And then R14 will contain the um, fast, dirty remaining free entries. So this will get decremented each time something is added to the fast, dirty list. Um, so that is the state kind of of everything. There are a lot of things that I need to check on. Um, but I think we should be able to just get to it. So if we hop into, we're just going to open on top of this file. We're going to open, eh, we can just split. Uh, we're going to open up um, folkil source. Uh, we're going to look at IL session. So IL session is kind of who manages everything for you. Uh, this is what manages all the statistics and all of this crazy, fancy stuff that happens here. Um, and effectively, what I want to do is in here somewhere, it's going to call emulate. So here's where it's calling this emulate function on the graph. And instead of calling emulate, I'm going to want to call... Um, I'm going to want to uh, JIT this, and then I'm going to want to call a like run or enter function that will be unsafe. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say like if emulate mode, we're just going to make that a, a global constant for now, although eventually we'll want to make that a, a tunable. So we'll just say constant uh, emulate mode bool true. We'll start in false. Um, when this is set to true, use emulation. Otherwise, use JIT. Okay, so in the case of JIT, we're just going to panic here and say uh, need to JIT. And this should obviously panic pretty, pretty hard. And we'll just put a semi here so it's happy with us. I uh, expected to tuple, get rid of that semi there. Okay, so that looks good. It's saying that it needs to JIT. So if we take a look at our JIT down here, where are we at? Uh, in here. I think I, I literally just call graph.jit, yeah. So here I'll do a, a graph.jit, and then this will give me the assembly. So I'm going to need a place to store this assembly, and I don't know if JIT does that. It shouldn't. So... I don't know if I allocate JIT space for this. Uh, ILVM state. 
Okay, it doesn't look like we have that yet. What are you emulating? In this case, uh, we're writing a JIT for an IL, which means we could emulate basically anything we want. Uh, we're going to write a 6502 emulator probably sometime relatively soon here, uh, but probably not during this stream. But we're going to emulate pretty much whatever we want is uh, effectively the goal. Okay, so we've got the master VM state here. Got the JIT cache, which is good. And... I'm trying to think how I want to how I want to manage kind of uh, the shape of this jit. So we're gonna we'll end up jitting this out, which means we have uh, here we have like bytes is equal to assembly backing. So now we have like the actual bytes that represent the graph that we just lifted. Um, but I need to let's see. Um... If we're in emulate mode, then call emulate. Otherwise, call that. So we'll, here we're gonna look that up. Yeah, we don't actually wanna do this JIT always here. We wanna do it here. Uh, if it's not in the master cache, then we're gonna lift this graph and we're gonna insert it into the master. Okay, and we do get a lock on here. So this aisle cache is locked which is good. That means no one can mutate this while we're working on it and then update a local cache. So what I want to do is when um, uh, perform the JIT. So in this case, I think we're always going to perform the JIT. Even if we're in emulation mode, we're still going to generate the JIT so we can make sure that it doesn't panic. Um, so this is going to perform the JIT and put it into the global JIT table. Um, and for that to work, I think I have like an alloc rwx function. Let me see. Uh, okay, cool. I do have an alloc rwx function in mmu source avx512 jit. And this will just allow us to allocate a large blob of rwx memory. Uh, kind of in an OS agnostic way. So we've got both the Linux and Windows versions of this, which is perfect. And I'm just going to put this in Falkal source. Uh, uh, JIT helpers.rs. We'll just whack it in here. I think that's fine. And then Falkal source. Uh, lib we'll just need to pull in that module as well pub mod jit helpers so so for jit helpers what i want to do is i want to do an uh struct jit memory and this will be a structure to hold a bunch of different jits Okay, and this will just have backing, and this will be a, a static mutable reference to U8 memory. This is going to be the, the raw backing for the entirety of the JIT region. Okay, and then we'll do struct, or we'll do impl JIT memory. And we'll do function new. Uh, create a new JIT memory region which is capable of holding up to bytes and this will take a u size and then we'll just turn jit memory and let's do a backing uh, alloc rwx bytes and these implementations will panic which is fine i don't really care about error handling in this case uh it doesn't really matter if we can cleanly exit or not, because if we can't allocate a JIT buffer, nothing's going to happen anyway, so I'm fine with a panic here. Uh, we're going to allocate this JIT memory. Then, what I want to do is pubfn um, create asm. And I think... 
how do I want to do this? So effectively, the JIT memory is going to be held inside of a lock, so only one person will be updating the JIT memory at a time, but someone might be executing the JIT memory while it's in use. That's fine. That's not a big, that's not a big deal. Um, uh, we'll put a in use, use size, uh, number of bytes actively in use in the backing. And in fact, since we're in Rust, we can just uh, kind of clean this up and we can say um, remaining. And this will be a uh, an A reference. Actually, this is a static reference, so we don't need this. This will be a static uh, mutable reference to U8. Uh, you know what we're going to do in use? It's a little bit cleaner here. We don't have like weird uh, two references to the same data. Okay, so this is going to create uh, create a new assembly stream. Um, and uh, create a new assembly stream which correctly knows where it will be located in memory. I'm gonna have some relative, uh, I'm gonna have some relative addresses in here, so this is important that I can do this. So what I'm gonna do is I mute self, and this is gonna return, uh, we're gonna make another structure, JIT allocation, um, a temporary structure that, um, Hmm. Mute self. That will return a temporary structure that holds an active working uh, assembly session that is contained in our JIT allocation. And can I just use a full chasm? Do I even need JIT memory? Uh, nah, I think I like this. So this will be the uh, assembler, and that will be operating on those bytes. And let me see. Blah, blah, blah. Doesn't like that. Doesn't like in use, of course. In use is zero when we start. 67. This is going to return a JIT allocation with an A ref. And this is going to be... Uh, uh, this is going to be the uh, memory is an A mute ref to JIT memory, a reference to the JIT memory, which we are working in. Okay, and then here we're going to do a JIT memory. A. This will return a JIT memory with a assembler folk. Uh, let mute asm is folk asm new. That's not the correct syntax. Uh, folk asm. We'll look at I'll graph jits. Here we go. Oh, it's asm stream. That makes sense. I was like, I don't remember ever typing that out. Uh, we'll want uh, asm mode and we'll want vec width in here. So we'll create a new assembler, an assembly stream, and this will be asm. And it will also have memory, which will take a self. So, okay. And then here we'll do, uh, this will take asm mode bits 64, and then we'll do asm.sets. Uh, Think that there we go. So we're gonna set this uh, vector width. So we're gonna set it to 512 bit vector mode, and we'll return out that object. So create a new assembler and set the vector width. And then I think I can do asm dot set base. And then here I can do uh, backing self or self dot backing self dot in use dot 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 as pointer as u size. So this will be uh, 
establish the base address of where this assembly will live. This is needed for relative branches and such. JIT memory or JIT allocation? Yeah, this should be a JIT allocation. Thank you. Okay, graph not found in the scope in aisle session. Yep, that's fine. Undeclared lifetime on that. We're gonna put, uh, uh, we'll put an A here. In fact, I don't even know if we need that. I think Russ is smart enough to figure that out now. Okay, expected an option. Cool. We'll just wrap that little little guy up. Okay. Finally, down in aisle session, where we call JIT here. Panic needed JIT. So here we're going to uh, perform the JIT. And we're going to change this up a, a little bit in a second here. We actually don't want to call this yet. Um, so that looks pretty solid. Okay, so we'll pull in that. Uh, we'll use uh, JIT helpers. And this will be a JIT memory. And uh, ILVM states mutex statistics, this IL cache. Uh, we're going to put another one. This is going to be uh, um, the global JIT buffer. Uh, not used for uh, local IL sessions. Only so the global master. Okay, this will be, we'll call this uh, global JIT. It'll be a mutex containing JIT memory. Uh, okay. Yep, we'll just whack in crate. Perfect. And doesn't like that because it's private. Of course it is. Down here, we'll make this public for JIT allocation and also JIT memory. And 312, here we're going to say uh, global JIT. It's going to be equal to a mutex new of uh, JIT memory new. I'm going to make this public. And we'll just say 32 megs for now. Okay, now is that going to get called for every single one? I think it is. Yeah, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to put uh, put a none in here. Um, we'll have to wrap that in a mutex, but that's fine. That's not a big deal. Uh, basically, we, we only want this field filled in for the global one, so we'll have to put this in an option, which is not a big deal. Okay. Then down, uh, where we call JIT. Here I'm going to do uh, get access to the global JIT. And this we will do a uh, master cache. Cool. So we'll do an IL. Oh, you know what? Aisle session, I think there is only one. Self. What is self? Self is an aisle VM. Yeah. I think there is only one aisle session. But I'm not quite sure. Aisle session. Create a new empty aisle session threads. Okay, yeah, I think there's only one. So then we're fine here. So here we don't need that option anymore, which makes me happy. Uh, where is that at? Uh, global JIT. This will be a JIT memory new 32 megs. Global JIT, no longer an option. Looks good. When we get to this point, we're going to lock the global JIT. So we'll say let global jit is equal to the aisle session dot global jit dot lock dot unwrap 
Uh, that's going to be mutable access here. And then we'll do global jit dot uh, create asm. Okay. Let asm is equal to that. And if I do print, I guess I don't. So this should just work. This should be fine. It's going to panic because we don't have JIT, but this should be fine. Okay. Need to JIT. So that will correctly create a new assembly stream. It's going to set up that backing correctly, and it's going to create this temporary JIT allocation. And then all I need to do here is uh, we're going to... I'm going to move this down. Oops. Move this down here, and I'll do an impl a jit allocation a canadian a and in this jit allocation i'm going to do a uh asm mute self mute uh asm stream get access to the raw assembly stream backing this jit allocation and this will just be a mute self.asm. Okay. Technically, I don't need an accessor. I could make that public. I'm going to keep that in mind as I'm thinking about it. That looks good. And then here I'll do an impl a drop for jit allocation a this. And I'll say function drop mute self print uh, dropping jit allocation bytes generated and this will do self dot asm dot len so once that goes out of scope once that created assembly routine goes out of uh okay zero bytes generated that looks great now here i can say graph dot jit and we'll pass it asm dot asm and graph not found in the scope. That's fine. We've got new graph here. So we'll jit out that new graph. Um, where are we at here? Here's where we're doing our lift. Okay, so now I want to do optimize and validate inside of here. Lift. So we're going to lift that graph this new graph here. We're going to optimize that graph and then we're going to validate the graph. So optimize the IL and validate that it is sane. And what are we going to do? Expected zero parameters. Yep, that's fine because in here we do a, an asm stream new. Actually here. And instead of doing that, It'll just take a parameter, which will be asm mute asm stream. No longer will return that. And I shouldn't need vec with or asm mood anymore. And 508. This just no longer needs to return an assembly stream. Okay, looks good. Now, if we take a look at here, made that mutable. New graph, we can't borrow. New graph is mutable. Um, uh, cannot borrow data in an arc as mutable. Yep. So we'll do that. And then here we'll do. Uh, equals arc new new graph wrap up the graph in an arc looks good expected one parameter on jit that is in mip 64 uh, yep we'll just get rid of this okay looks good and then in main.rs which is what we're currently writing i think i'll bench yep at 70 we're no longer going to call this jit stuff 
Cool. Okay, so here we see dropping JIT allocation, 81 bytes generated. So that allows us to kind of uh, assemble in this assembly stream. And then once that assembly stream has been created, we're going to actually copy that into the backing. So we'll do, um, we'll do backing is equal to self.asm.backing. Uh, get access to the assembled bytes. And then I can do a uh, copy the assembled bytes into the JIT buffer. And here I'll do uh, self.memory. What was it? Backing. Self.memory.backing at self.memory. Uh, let in use is equal to self dot memory dot in use. This will be at in use to in use plus backing dot len. Copy from slice backing, and then we'll do self dot memory in use plus equals. Uh, we'll do equals self dot. We can do plus equals here. Uh, backing dot len update the number of bytes in use. Okay, so um, dropping JIT allocation, those that many bytes allocated, and we're gonna copy into in use plus in use backing length from the backing, and then we're gonna update the number of bytes that are in use in that JIT allocation, and that should be good. And then that will drop all the references and we should be happy there. I uh, got the square bracket here. Kindly remind me what impl is. Uh, impl is implement. So basically I'm saying I want to implement uh, functions for a JIT allocation structure. So I'm saying for a JIT allocation structure, I want to implement some routines on it. And in this case, I'm implementing uh, a function called uh, assembly. Or assemble. And then in this case, I'm saying I want to implement a trait called drop. And drop requires that you implement certain things. And this is kind of how generics work in Rust, is you can have types, uh, you can have templated types that require, like, okay, I will accept any type as long as it implements drop. Because if you know that it implements drop, that it implements this function, which means you can now generically call that function. Basically, you know that that exists in the VF table. Um, that's kind of how that works there. So in this case, now we should be updating that JIT allocation. All fine and dandy, requesting a lifting of that. That should be good. And now we've JITted into our own global assembly graph. Fantastic. And now I just need to make uh, another data structure that allows me to know the mappings between um, lifted IL things to their JIT. So I might hijack the IL cache. So local IL cache, uh, all the graphs stored here. Um, and here I'm just going to store a uh, store here for lockless access. Okay. And uh, I'll cache will resolve to that. And then it will also resolve to the location of the JIT. The second part of the tuple resolves the address of the JIT, which contains the graph. OK, that looks good. We're going to have to clean up a couple things. And we have our aisle cache there. And here we have another one. Uh, you size there. Uh, the second part of the of the tuple contains the address of the JIT for the uh, for the graph that was lifted. Okay. So now if we take a look at aisle cache, 
if it contains that key, then look that up, then insert this, then here. That's going to have the local thing. We're going to return that out here. That will take graph.clone. Looks fantastic. Then in here, when I perform that JIT allocation, global JIT create asm. Um, let's see. I can do let base equals global JIT dot asm dot base. I don't know if I have an accessor for that field. Uh, and then new graph, this will take base. And then that I'll cache insert, that should just work. Uh, yeah, 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 yep, yep, yep. Uh, so on that, we're gonna get the assembly stream. And in fact, we could maybe have that return the base. When we do this, set base. Uh, yeah, we'll do that. So that'll return a JIT allocation and then a, a U size, which is the base address. So JIT allocation followed by a base. Fantastic. So this will now be a let mute assembly followed by a base is equal to the uh, create that assembly and 238 expected tuple at 238. What's going on here? 238 here. Uh, insert it into the master. That's where we insert it. Uh, base hasn't been created yet. That's fine. So we just have to move this up. No problem. 256, emulate not found on that field. That makes sense because we just want to put a dot zero there. And instead, we're just going to do a graph. And then we'll get the JIT base as well here. And we'll put an underscore so we don't get a warning right now. Okay. Fantastic. So need to JIT. We'll just put a hex this here. And this will be a JIT base. We'll just do a print, do a loop. Beautiful. So this is the address of where the JIT went. So if I open up WinBag here, I'm gonna grab WinBag. We're gonna attach to IL Bench. Oh, son of a bitch! I can't, I can't attach a debugger to a to a Linux process. I guess. Okay. We'll just run it in Windows. Should be compatible. There might be a file name that I have hard-coded. Nope, looks good. Okay, need to JIT, and we're just going to put a new line because that was bothering me. We'll pop up WinBag here, and we'll attach to it once it's up and running. Okay, if we take a look at this, we should now be able to look at this address and disassemble it, and that, that, that looks like AVX512 JIT. Um, yep, and we see a bunch of zeros from where we don't have anything. And then we have our int3. So, yep, we correctly, we were able to JIT everything we wanted to at the location that was requested. Um, and then I presume that when we go to JIT the next thing, it will end up right here directly afterwards, which is exactly what I want. Uh, I actually really like that. That, that behavior is really clean. Um, I gotta say, I love, I love seeing clean clean stuff like that. So now I'm going to do an unsafe. We're going to uh, call a function called enter JIT. And enter JIT is going to take everything that we need to do JIT. So the first thing it's going to take is the JIT base. Uh, this will actually be the JIT address. Um, so we'll need the JIT address. What else will we need here? I'm just interested kind of in this calling convention here in the comments. So uh, I need 64 bytes uh, scratch memory. So and the scratch memory will want to actually make a persistent storage for that. And this will put in the ILVM. 
um, uh, JIT scratch memory, uh, 60, 64 byte align JIT scratch memory. This will be JIT scratch. And then this will contain, uh, I have a library called vectorized, which implements these vectors. So this is just going to contain, uh, I think just like, I don't know, probably 16 of these vectors is good enough. Uh, we probably don't have that in scope. So let's take a look at, uh, Interjit, that's not implemented yet, and then uh, that needs to panic until we're done with that. Panic, ran JIT, don't need a new line for panics, and JIT scratch is at 101, missing JIT scratch, looks good. So JIT scratch will contain a vector splat 0 of 32, so it just contains zeros. Uh, 106. Oh, I did 16. Holy shit, I had that scoped. Beautiful. That's what I like to see. Okay. Man, I love when that pans out. That makes me so happy. Okay, so... This enter JIT function, this is going to take the JIT address... It's also going to take a pointer to a line scratch memory, which will be at self dot jit scratch. Uh, and we'll take a mutable ref to that, because technically we're going to be using that mutably. We need a uh, root page table access. That should be, yep, on the ILVM. So we'll do a, a mute self dot um, MMU dot let me see mmu source um page table page uh struct soft mmu page table the root level dirty list contains all the dirty virtual addresses Uh, ST page table, okay, looks good. Uh, page table dot iter. Dot backing, okay. I call everything backing. Uh, self dot MMU dot backing. There'll be a mutable pointer to the root page table. And this I'm also going to make, that'll be a mutable uh, uh, vector pointer as well. And the vector will imply that it's aligned, which is uh, required for a calling convention. Okay, now we have points to 64 byte aligned IL registers, which we currently don't use. So we're gonna say scratch. Uh, R11 points to the constant storage table, which, uh, ooh, that we're gonna have to plumb through. Okay. Um, yep. So we're gonna have to put the constant storage table as well in the uh, global JIT. Oops. Take a look at the global JIT and uh, we'll also in the global JIT, we'll put access to um, const store. Global JIT, uh, global JIT buffer and constant storage, blah, blah, blah. Perfect, looks fantastic. Okay, so then when we go to set that up uh, here, this now takes a tuple and this will instead take a constant store and we're gonna say up to uh, a million different constants, I think is fair. 
Okay, good. Matches, matches. Fantastic. Okay, then here we'll get uh, mute global JIT and mute const store. Put that on a new line. And we'll get the assembly, create an assembly uh, thing here. And then here we'll uh, assemble using uh, const store. Whoa. We'll do the testing on Windows for a little bit here. Um, 271, enter JIT. Yep, we're not done with this yet. Okay, doesn't like that const store doesn't exist. That's going to be in our JIT here. This just needs to take const store, mute const store. I think I capitalize it. Nice. And here, we'll just want this line in our aisle session. I, we should have that scope. Yep. Okay. Uh, 244. Expected a mutex guard, but found a tuple. Okay. So this will be, uh, we'll say global JIT here. We'll say global JIT.0, and then this will be uh, mute global JIT.1. I think we're fine on lifetimes there. Oops. Uh, that needs asm. Whoops, whoa, doing some weird stuff here. My bad, there we go. Okay, global JIT can't borrow as mutable, of course not. And first mutable borrow occurs there. So it doesn't like that. Uh, I think if we destructure it, we might be fine. Let's mute JIT. Uh, uh, global JIT. And I'll call this uh, jitmem, and then mute uh, const store is equal to global jit, and then this will be jitmem, and then this will take a const store, and I think I'm gonna need to do a deref on there. Yep, we'll just deref that. Uh, mutable reference here. Yeah, it's not gonna like that because it's not borrowed. We'll just do this. Uh, data moved there and there. Uh, you know, I might be able to do ref mute here. Okay, can't borrow as mutable, of course because now it's a mutable reference. There we go, okay. That's figured out, JIT address, 261 not being used, JIT scratch uh, not being used. So that looks good. So now it's using that constant storage database, which means that we can go down to our this, and we can say, um, ooh, ooh, ooh. I need to get the, uh, constant storage pointer in the aisle VM. So in here we'll have JIT scratch, and then this will be the um, address of constant storage database owned by aisle session. Const store. This will be a mutable reference to U64s. Uh, 105. Yeah, okay. So it doesn't like this in ILVM. Um, and this is doing fork from. Where's my aisle session at? I guess we can just put an option here. And then we'll resolve that the first time through. 105, uh, const store, none. Yeah, because I don't 
know. Yeah, I don't yet have access to. Ooh, 427 camp. Oh. Oh, I can't send a U64. Okay. We'll just make it a U size. Field has never used the comp store. Technically, I should wrap that in an arc, but then I need to wrap it in a mutex, which is really gross. Um, so, comp store. Okay, here we're going to say if self.constore.isNone is none. Uh, resolve the constant storage address from the uh, aisle session and yeah we don't have a linking to that constant storage database so we should do that So we'll put a we'll put an arc mutex const store and also an address. Um uh, I can I can get it directly off the aisle session. Gonna go naps. See you around, man. Thanks for tuning in. Hey, Tears of Scarlet, how are you doing? Thanks for following. Copy SH, thank you for following. J1 under me, thank you for following. How's everyone doing? All right, we don't need that constant storage there. Uh, what we'll do is we will cache the constant storage in the aisle session because we always run with that context. Beautiful, so we have an aisle session here. Um, so global JIT, and then we'll have a const store U size. Uh, here we'll just do a, a mutable U64 address of the constant storage database. Okay. Okay, once again, that'll have to be a U size. No problem. And that's at 348. Uh, here we'll do let const store is equal to this. Allocate a new constant storage. This will take const store, and then uh, const store will take a const store dot as mute pointer as u size. Uh, I think dot backing probably is what I call it, like everything else. Wow, it's not that this time. So I actually call it dot table. Okay. Um, wait, was that right? Uh, to the linear constant database, yes. So we'll do here, we'll do const store dot table as mute pointer, or as pointer in this case. Constant storage in this case is just cache. This means we don't have to uh, grab that mutex every time we're grabbing that constant storage because perf in this tool, uh, perf is going to really matter. So here we'll do, uh, we'll pass in enter jit. This will take uh, constant storage. So what do we what do we pass in now? We pass in a pointer to scratch. A pointer to the root page table for the current thing. A pointer to the constant storage table. Um, a 64-byte aligned target register. So let's see if I have target regs. Yep, vector. Looks great. So this one's easy. Self.target regs. Done. Uh, points to 64-byte aligned target registers. Good. And then we need the fast, dirty list and the fast, dirty remaining. So fast dirty is going to be equal to um, 
self dot mmu dot let's see dirty dirty and dirty remain so that's in reset I don't think I return that out anywhere okay so we'll do uh, pub fn uh, fast dirty self get the current pointer and uh, remain remaining entries for the fast dirty list and this will return a uh, u size actually this can return a mutable uh, u64 and a u size and for this we'll do uh, self dot dirty ooh it's actually a tuple why is that a tuple Dirty list contains the list of dirty guest virtual addresses and the pointer to the page table entry which describes them such that we can clear. Oh my god, that's brilliant. Love it. Okay, so that's basically two U64s. Uh, fast, dirty. And then the number of entries remaining. So we'll return out a tuple of self.dirty.asmute pointer. Technically, it's a vert address and a u size. And then we have self.dirty remain. Right. Self.dirty remain is max dirty. Okay. Beautiful. Uh, you know, we will do this. Even though we don't mutate in this function, I like to make sure that. Uh, what's going on? 282. Yep. Uh, fast, dirty. So, fast, dirty, uh, pointer. Fast, dirty, remain. Great. Honestly, we can just pass the MMU, hopefully. Then we can obtain that there. And then we'll have to have a set fast, dirty. We'll, we'll do that inside the enter JIT function. Uh, finally, what else do we have here? Uh, that's it. We need a, an active VMK mask and, and an index of an active VM and the following VMK mask. So we'll need the online, so we'll do self.online. And that's it. Index of an active VM and then the following one, which uh, we can compute that in enter JIT. Oh, we're making progress now. Okay. Self.constore, not found. Of course not. Um, this is going to be an uh, IL session. And target regs. I think this is in states. Okay. Nice. Enter JIT, not found. All right. Now we're going to be going and we're going to implement this function which will be very unsafe we'll do unsafe fn enter jit uh, jump into and start executing jit okay so this is what we implemented so let's see if we can get all this right jit address u size we've got online which is uh this should be a mask we should have uh, scratch, which is a mutable reference to vector of uh, 16 vector elements. We should have an MMU, which will be a mutable reference to, uh, uh, I think I just call it MMU, uh, soft MMU. What else do we need? Uh, const store. And finally, the target regs which will be a, a mutable vector and uh, max target regs, which is there. Okay. Nice. We might have some of these types wrong. We'll see uh, JIT address uh, 273. Uh, we'll just want to borrow that up there. 
You know what? Fine, we'll DRF it here. What do you mean? It's really safe? Yeah, we're just jumping into some arbitrary code. Just normal, normal safe stuff. Okay, so we have an issue with JIT Scratch um, being borrowed here. Can, uh, um, basically, if we didn't do self.mmu, we'd be fine here. So I think we'll do self.mmu. Uh, here we'll do uh, JIT. We will break it up. Um, let's see. Uh, fast, dirty pointer and fast, dirty len. It's going to be equal to self.mmu.fastdirty. And we'll just whack these two in instead. Fast, dirty pointer, fast, dirty len. Fantastic. Obviously, not the correct syntax anymore. So this will be the fast, dirty pointer, which will be a, a mutable reference to a vert adder usize tuple. And then we'll have fast, dirty, remain. This will be a uh, u-size. Okay, 261. Doesn't like that. Okay, so we're going to have to relax this then. We're going to have to say self. Um, and then here we're just going to say... Uh, yeah, let's say it's constant. Because that's, that's complaining because we have a borrowed entry on that aisle cache in the graph. Um, quite frankly, you know what? You know what? You know what? So this is complaining, of course, at 261. Um, what I can do is... How do I borrow just a single thing? Because, like, that would borrow both the things. I want to, like, destructure and just borrow this. I could just do, like, this. It's kind of gross, but I can do that. And then that means it's no longer barred, which means this should now compile. Okay. Beautiful. Now, what I should be able to do is I just need to set up this environment so i need to set up kind of this uh this context so all right um so what is it uh zmm4 through zmm29 these are aisle registers so we'll also want uh, aisle regs mute vector uh, probably max aisle regs. Wow, that's a big that's a big fucking number. Um, but that's for the that's mainly for the emulator, which doesn't have register allocation, so it will always like keep using new aisle registers. So that's fine. So we use aisle regs down here. Oops. Uh, back up to this, and we'll s we'll pass in middle reference to the aisle registers, and that's where we're going to save and restore those from. Oh, fantastic! So now we're gonna write some assembly, and it's gonna be volatile, and we're gonna use Intel syntax because it's just it's just better. It's, well. It's just correct, to be honest. Okay, so now we have our little assembly here. And all we need to do is we need to set up kind of this calling convention. Um, and I think I'm probably going to manually save and restore all these registers. Because I don't, I don't trust the compiler. Yeah, I don't trust the compiler to be able to handle this correctly. So push rcx push rdx push rsi push rdi push r8 push r9 push r10 technically push r11 push r12 push r13 push r14 okay we'll just do the obverse pop r13 pop r12 pop r10 
Uh, probably should pop R11 in there too. Pop R9, pop R8, pop RDI, pop RSI, pop RDX, pop RCX, pop RBX, pop RAX. Okay. AX, BX, CX, DX, SI, DI, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I don't think I use R15 in that, nor do I use it in the MMU JIT. Uh, MMU source JIT this. Uh, hot loops for R15 iterations. Okay. Yep. So we're going to save all that, and we're going to restore everything. And now we just need to set up all these arguments. So we know that R8 is going to be passed in. This is going to be right here. We'll say that directly into R8, we're going to pass in the scratch memory. Scratch.asmute pointer. Fantastic. Uh, R9 is going to point to the root page table, which will be... Uh oh we don't we don't pass that in. Uh, and then we'll do here we'll grab the um, uh, page table is equal to self dot mmu dot backing. Okay. Yep. Okay, looks good. Looks good. Uh, yeah, unclosed delimiter. No surprise. Okay, nice. Uh, expected eight parameters. Yep, and we just need to take a look at the uh, this backing that returns a mute u size, and we put that right after. Where did we put that? Enter vm. Uh, enter JIT. Normally you call it enter VM, I guess. Uh, I put it right after JIT scratch. So after JIT scratch, we'll want to put in the uh, page table. This will be a, a mutable U size. So R9, this will just contain page table. Looks good. So let's make sure we don't push and pop that. What else do we have? R10. This is going to contain uh, scratch, doesn't matter. R11. This is const store. How do we pass that in? Const store, just a U size. Looks good. R12. Uh, points to 64 byte aligned target registers. So this will be target regs. Dot as mute pointer. R13 will pass in. This will be the fast dirty list, so uh, fast dirty pointer. And then the fast dirty remaining, I think is what I called this. Looks good. So eight, nine, we've got the scratch, we've got the page table, we've got the constant store table, we've got the target registers in R12, we've got the fast dirty list, and we've got the fast dirty remaining free entries. Don't want a trailing comma in this case. And then 11, 12, 13, and 14. Okay. 8, 9, 11, 12, 13, 14. Like a glove. Okay, now I also am going to need to pass in... We'll just throw it in uh, Raxy Boy. Uh, we'll pass into Rax. Actually, we'll put it in R10. We'll put in R10 because we know we don't clobber this in the JIT. Technically, we could set up the clobbers correctly and it would be fine, um, but we're just going to ignore this. Uh, we're going to jump to JIT Adder. Okay. Looks good. What are we not using? We're not using aisle regs and we're not using online. And that's fine because aisle regs we're going to pass in uh, 
you know what? I I want to pass this in as Rax. And then we're going to mark Rax as a clobber. Um, that means we free up our 10. Uh, I guess technically we're not clobbering Rax because we're pushing and popping it. So here we'll do... Uh, 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 I think I'm... We're just calling Rax. So we're going to call Rax there. Run into that JIT address. Online mask. Okay. Um, then we'll pass into RBX. We should have RBP in here as well. RBP is scratch. RSP is stack. So we'll push uh, RBP. We put that after RDI, so we'll pop it here. Okay. Looks good. ZMMs, uh, we're going to have to save and restore basically all of those. In fact, I think... I think I'm just going to price save and restore all of them. Is there a way to call arbitrary memory as a function pointer in Rust? Yeah, you can cast it to a function pointer. Um, yeah, you, you can do like unsafe, uh, uh, like, uh, it's a little bit more complex than this, but you can do like jit adder as uh, mute function ASDF. Actually, it might not be much more complex than this. It might literally just be this and then deref, and then you can... Uh, say like a U32 and then like five. So should be able to do this. This might not be the uh, perfectly correct syntax and I think you need to ref it. Um, technically you'd expect that you could do like this, but it doesn't like that. So you actually have to go through an intermediary where you pass in a reference and then you deref it. But it doesn't affect the actual, the compiler's smart enough to do that dereffing for you so it does turn into just a direct call like in this case it would literally look like a call um uh we would see like a uh we can actually try it out fuck it why not why not um jit adder as mute function as a mutable uh pointer to a function we're gonna say as a constant pointer to a function u32 we're gonna deref it to get that function pointer and then we're gonna actually invoke it just need another paren there. And we might need uh, another extra set of parens. Uh, unexpected token const store. Yeah, we'll get back to that later. Um, casting that is invalid, of course, uh, as const uh, use size. So this should do the trick. And this will crash, of course. Uh, we'll be able to look in our call stack, what that actually emit. In this case, uh, I expect to see a... Um, a legal instruction, of course. Uh, so if we look back at the return address, uh, if we disassemble backwards, we see just a call RBX. So, and that's kind of exactly what we expected, just a direct call of that. Um, it doesn't actually go through this like DREF stuff you see. But yeah, that's how you, that's how you call that. Okay, so now we also want to pass into RBX. We want to pass in RBX, 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 uh, 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 hmm. <laughs> well, we definitely need to pass in our IL register buffer here, IL regs, and I think we did everything right here, right? All of these are correct. Push and pop. We send all these things incorrectly, so that's good. Uh, we need to do the K masks, and then we also need to do the ZMM. So I'm going to take one quick bio break. I'll be right back.
All right. Sorry about that. Roop. Okay, so effectively what we need to do is I need to uh, save and restore all of the um, AVX512 state, and there is no AVX512 exchange operation, so uh, what you're about to see is going to get really gross. Um, in fact, we're probably going to actually generate the code in Python, so let's... Uh, Gvim foop.py probably already exists. No, it oh no foop.py today. So we're gonna go through four reg in range 32. We'll do a, a print of vector move double quad word align 64 of R10. More gross than push and pop all the registers. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Oh, yeah, it's going to get bad. So we're going to do a, a vectored move double quad word aligned into a quad word pointer, or actually, uh, we're going to say into RBX plus uh, percent, or OX percent dot 3X. Uh, and then we're going to pass in a ZMM percent D. And we'll pass in reg times 64 and we'll pass in reg okay so this is like ballpark what we want poop.py okay okay that's not too bad so that's uh what we're gonna do is we're gonna move everything up we're gonna move everything up so we're gonna call this the uh um save or like the host Offset. This is going to be equal to uh, 64 times 32. Um, offset to store host uh, vector regs2. And then we'll have the guest offset is equal to 0. Offset to store guest vector regs2. And this will be like save, restore. Okay, so this uh, this will be offset is going to be equal to host offset plus reg times 64. So this will get the offset that we want to save to. Yep, looks good. So we're saving all of the host registers. And then uh, we're going to just do that again. But we'll do guest offsets and we'll load them. So you just flip those little args around, offset. Okay, so we're gonna save all of them to these addresses and then we're gonna load all the guest ones from these addresses. And uh, then we're just gonna do it twice effectively. So then once we're done, we're gonna do guest offset and then we're gonna do host offset. So this should be correct. So uh, effectively we're gonna store all of them, store all the host register states uh, into these fields, then we're going to load all the guest register states from these fields, and then we're going to, once we're done in the guest, we're going to store all the guest states back into their corresponding fields, and then we're going to load all of the states from the host. So, pretty clean, pretty simple, nothing too crazy here. We're going to put, like, uh, a couple prints in here, so there's, like, a good spacing between them. And then we're just going to copy this, and we'll just paste this here. And this should be 64 lines. Yep. 64. Just tab that in a couple times. Looks nice and lined up. And then I'll get this on the opposite side. Looks fantastic. 64. Shift that in. Okay. And now we'll just do a little bit of cleanup here. You know what? I, I think I like this a little bit more. And those look good. Those line up. And then these will have to do one of these bad boys. Looks good. Okay. So RBX is fine. Even though we use RBX as a scratch register, we save and restore it uh, internal to here. So we end up getting that back. The same goes for RAX. We save and restore and we get that back. So this should be good. 
Okay, now the only thing we're missing is online. We're also probably going to need to save some of the K-Masks. Not quite sure. Um, so the online mask, we're going to pass this in. Uh, let's just put it in RCX because we can. RCX is going to be equal to online.mask. I think... Uh, not implemented for vectorized. So if I look at vectorized source uh, impl mask uh, dot raw. Okay. As u64, and then we're gonna do inside of here. Uh, we're gonna do a, a k move w into k1 from uh, uh, ECX. So load the online k-mask, jump into the JIT. So that should cause k1 to get loaded with all Fs. Then we should jump into the JIT. Everything should be fine and dandy. So this should theoretically work. Obviously, it's going to uh, fail with an illegal instruction. Um, but if we check out, oh yeah, it's not even going to get into the state. Ah. Okay, so we've got a couple things I need to do. I need to set up uh, ZMM30 correctly, and I need to set up K7 as well. So K7 will grab uh, K move W K7. That's going to come from EDX. And we'll put at RDX, we'll put in um, select, uh, this is like the following VM mask as U64. So we want to generate the following VM, VM mask. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the least significant bit that's set. Um, I think in Rust, I can do like an LZ count. Uh, not quite that. Uh, leading zeros, I think. Come on. Leading zeros. Okay, perfect. Uh, counts the number of leading zeros or trailing zeros. I'm actually going to go with trailing zeros. That would be three in that case. So what we're going to do is uh, let's trail zero is equal to um, online.raw.trailing zeros. So that will get the number of disabled VMs. This will be zero in most cases. And then that will be the index of the first VM that's operating. So we'll assert uh, that trail zero is less than or equal to seven. Uh, we'll just say less than eight. Um, uh, no VMs active. Basically, if if all of the VMs are masked off, then no VMs are active. So then we're going to compute a whatever we called that mask, uh, brrr, following VM mask. So we'll do let following VM mask is equal to 1U8, shift to the left by trail 0. So... Um, if there are no trailing zeros, it will be zero. So we'll do one shift zero, and that means the mask will be a one. Um, and basically, this this will uh, mask uh, create a mask of the online mask that only has one bit set. In this case, we just pick the least significant. If can't bit, I think that logic works out. Looks good to me. Fantastic. Okay, following via mask, 1U8, shift to the left. Uh, assert that the trail zero is less than eight. That means we could shift up to seven. Shifting by seven is fine. And then we go down to here to RDX, and then we load that up into K7. And this trail zero, this is actually going to be the uh, following VM. And we're going to put the following VM there. 
And that's the index, because if we look at this one, uh, index of an active VM has to be stored in ZMEM30. So what I can then do is I can go to uh, IL regs 30 is equal to vector splat following VM as u64 uh, uh, as u size, I think I, I do for my splats. So this will be um, broadcast the following VM index to all lanes in uh, ZMM30 for the guest. Man, everything is just falling into place today. Making it real easy. Beautiful. Okay. So if we took a look at RBX plus uh, 400 minus uh, 80. Uh, yeah, the following VM is zero in this case. If I did online mask single uh, five. I'm just curious if this will have a five in there. Uh, we'll do a, a DQ RBX plus 380. Ooh. Ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, wait. Uh, 780. Oh. Uh-oh. 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 Uh -oh. Let's, uh, let's take a look at this. Print online mask this um then i'm going to print the i mask is that sure you're crashing on the call i'm not i'm crashing on the very first instruction here but the it should be filled in by this vector splat here that's what i'm looking for i'm i'm clearly making some stupid mistake so it's not going to be far off from something like that so online mask follow mask and then this is going to be the, uh, um, yeah, this CPU doesn't support AVX512. Um, online mask, follow mask, and then... <laughs> online mask, follow mask, followed by uh, follow VM. And that one will print decimally. So we'll do online.raw uh, following VM mask following VM. Okay. I might have also done my, my math wrong on the offset. Okay. How do I expect a value to be here? Because I'm setting it up in this aisle register 30 location here. So this should be filling it in. Uh, so here we see online mask is DF. Well, that's wrong. Um, mask single. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. Single. That's going to take an ID. It's going to take one shift ID. And put that as the mask. Um... What's going on here? Online. Uh, oh, I'm probably doing a reset. Ooh, why would the top one not be running? Mask all. Let's take a look at all. So let's see if this is getting hit. Print uh, setting all online. Uh, setting all online. Okay, online mask. Uh, run. While they're not all disabled, online is equal to PC's most frequent online. Vector splat. Target path. 
zero PCs equal to that get regs PCs whoa print PCs are this I think the top one doesn't have a uh, the leap PC for some reason I'm not sure why uh yeah it's only one of the lanes oh that's because uh that that makes sense here okay yeah 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 online mask all so this yeah that was causing only the fifth one to get updated which then like invalidated a bunch of other state so that makes sense um but here if we see they're all elite we see online mask ff uh follow mask one follow vm is zero um that should be fine and then down here what i can do is i can say let online is equal to mask a uh, single five and this is just a test temporarily And we should see an online mask that a follow mask of 20 and a follow VM of five. Um, and then if we looked in the if we looked at the memory ad uh, DPS RBX plus 800 minus 80, uh, we see all the fives here. We should see eight fives. So if I did uh, if I did an L9, we should see one zero at the end. So that looks good. Yes, RBX is set at that point. Okay, everything looks good. Okay, so we compute the following VM. Uh, we set up the raw, the following VM mask. Okay. And now the final thing I'm going to want to do is uh, I want to save and restore K masks, which, um, man, I don't know if there's a way to. So using that, we're not using RBP. Well, we don't want to clobber it. Um, ECX, EDX. At this point, we've pushed those. So here I'm going to do a um, K move W into uh, EBP. And we're going to move K1, push RBP. It's kind of gross. Uh, hopefully I can put these with semicolons here. Looks like I can. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then we'll be able to do this on the opposite side. Uh, yeah, basically we're gonna do a pop RBP K move W into K7 of EBP. One, or six, five, four, three, two, one. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so that should save and restore all of the K masks. We're saving and restoring all of the AVX 512 state, and the JIT shouldn't affect anything else. Okay, that looks beautiful. Um, okay. Then that's going to update all of those. Calling conventions look good. And yeah, we should be fine. Okay, so what I'm going to want to do is I've got some, uh, just a special little thing in, um, uh, TKO fuzz and like brawler, I think should have a, a cargo. Mm. Do I um, really, really, where are the dot? Where are the config files? No, no, here we go. Um, and we'll just set this up CRT static. So we'll make a mictor dot cargo gvim dot cargo config. I'm just gonna make sure that it gets 
statically linked. Actually, that's for MSVC, which we don't need. Uh, armdir SQ uh, dot cargo. Uh, get uh, okay. We'll worry about get later. So uh, I should be able to do. Oh, I do have a deploy. Nice. Uh, SP aisle bench deploy and uh, okay it should be called Phyland okay Phyland uh, and this is I'll bench we'll take target release I'll bench and deploy. Uh, oh, whoa. Wrong network. Okay. Oh shit. I didn't know I had that SSH key already configured. Alright. Alright. Actually, I have no idea how that's all thing. Oh, I, I have it in the in the whistle I have it, but I don't have it set up in my host. That makes sense. It's like, what the hell? Okay, I'll bench trace. Oh, my God. <laughs> Woo! First try. So we're hitting the breakpoint trap, uh, which means uh, if, if we look one instruction above, we see an int three. That means we're actually executing, uh, I guess, all of the JIT. And we're getting to int three. So what the what I want to look at is I want to look at R12 uh, directly at R12. I want to look at X10 XG on R12. And here we see it's at 400. So it did go through and loop, and it actually got that up to the uh, 1,024 iterations. And all the VMs stayed online. I should be able to do like a R um, K1. Oops, IRK1. K1 looks good. Uh, K2 is just kind of what's used for all of those comparisons. That's fine. If you look at like the last thing that held that register, it should be ZMM27. Uh, so this should be uh, also 400. And I think I can do a v, uh, V8 in 64. How do you do that? I always, I always forget the syntax, but whatever. We, we can see it has all the 400s. Um, so that should have looped 400 times. Uh, looks like we did all of that first try. Um, I'm not too surprised. I mean, we set up the const store. So if we take a look at X10, XG on R11, this constant storage, we see a 400 in that one. Uh, in this, we see a 1 because it's adding 1. Uh, we see kind of the loop targets. Uh, in this case, we actually need to fix these loop targets. Uh, but that's not a big deal. That is pretty cool. That is pretty damn cool. So that is up and running. Now, instead of doing... Uh, now, instead of an int 3, so... I guess we can start closing down some of these. Uh, instead of an int3, we can do a ret. And I can do an asm.move uh, register racks immediate. Uh, I guess we can just start with uh, this being the trap code. Um, this is basically going to say that a trap occurred and then. I think I want ZMM0, uh, in this case, uh, vector move double, double quad word, or align 64, 
we'll move into uh, VREG ZMM0, which I think I might have pulled these in. Uh, it should be this. Uh, using KMask. And then Trap should take in, I think, one argument, which is the Trap code. And we just have to get that... Uh, Resolve that ILR, so we'll get trap code is equal to resolve this. This is for register allocation. Uh, and then we'll do trap code. So basically, and you know, we're going to make this like a little bit more special of a concept. We'll say like uh, uh, Python uh, import random hex random dot random zero. 2 to the 32, and we want the first non-signed one. There you go. Uh, so we'll just say this. And 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. So, you know what? 1, 2, 3. So, uh, return from the JIT with a special code indicating a trap. And the trap information is held in trap uh, in ZMM0. So once this exits, we'll be able to see the trap code in ZMM0, and then we'll also see the uh, racks value there. And this is complaining. Um, I think I want to do reg racks. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I probably didn't put a square bracket here. Looks about right. Um... Do I not use a normal register here? I probably don't. Um, use Volchasm operand register as reg. Okay, 2D1, uh, 49. Oh, is this a constant? Oh, it is. Uh, since that is a constant, we can do a, a constant store. So this will be a VP broadcast queue of constant store trap code dot zero. So I'll broadcast it out. So this is this is not an IL register. That's not a dynamic field. That's actually just a constant. So we can broadcast out the constant there. Um, and that expected a U64, but found a U size, fine. Okay, so now this should succeed. Hopefully we come back out of our, our JIT. Looks good, ran JIT, we hit our panic. Fantastic. So. Um, I'm going to put a print here. Warning, need to update fast, dirty, remain. I'm putting this here because I just remembered this, and I will probably forget. Uh, and if I end up uh, forgetting that, that's going to really, really suck. Okay. So, need to update fast, dirty, remain. At the end here, we're going to go through, uh, brrr, looks good. We're going to have an output in racks, so we can actually whoop, and a whoop. And what I can do is I can say that uh, there's going to be an output field in racks, which is going to be the exit code. And then we'll just do uh, up here, we'll do let exit code u64 and print jit exited with this exit code. Okay, jit exited with uh, the 4ab400, which is exactly what we wanted. And then we'll print out the extra information there, uh, which we could get at IL regs zero. And this should have the uh, exit code reason. So if we take a look at our trap, we have dead. And so we should see dead in all of those lanes, and it looks good. So that looks friggin' great. Uh, setting, I'm gonna get rid of some of these prints. Print, setting all online, that can go away. PCs are this, gone, okay. So that means it is now running that code, which looks really cool. So ran JIT, and this no longer has to panic. 
Uh, and now this can return the exit code. Um, caused VM exit. So this will actually return the mask that caused a VM exit and the exit code. So if we take a look at the end here, and this will put it at parity with the emulator. So we'll put a, this will return a mask, which was responsible for VM exit and an exit code, uh, which I'm guessing I made pretty. Folk aisle source. Probably an aisle graph exit code. Uh, I'll exit, exit, exit. I'll result. Um, VM exited. Uh, VM exited due to. Uh, VM exited due to a trap. So we'll do a trap, and then that's going to return a. Uh, you know what? I actually don't need a vector in that case um, because all the trap codes are the same. So the trap code is just going to be a U64 uh, with a given trap code. And let me look at trap. Uh, I define that as an aisle word, which I think I do as a U size. So we're going to say that's a U size. And then down here, instead of broadcasting that, we're just going to put this into reg register... Um, our BX will uh, load up uh, RBX. You know, we will we will throw that in the VREG uh, ZMM0. Uh, you know what? I'm trying to think how many things I might need to return out. Because if I do RBX, that needs to be another output. Ah, uh, it's more correct. It's more correct. So this, we're going to do... We're gonna set RBX to this, and then the faulting uh, K1. K1 can dynamically change, so I need to make sure that K1 gets synced. So we're gonna jump into the JIT. Once this is done, we're gonna do a K move W of uh, ECX K1. And we don't want to push pop ECX anymore. Oops, we were commenting these out. So ECX, ECX. You know what? I will delete them. It's a little cleaner. Okay, so ECX, uh, we're going to save that as the online K mask jump into the JIT, brrr, do all our JIT stuff, and then at the end, we're going to uh, write out the resulting online mask, which could have changed, and we'll update the... we'll update ECX with that. So then we'll have... Um, RCX will be resulting online. So that'll be the resulting online mask. Let this say U64. Okay. Online. We'll put a new line in here. This will be resulting online. And we'll just have this panic for now until we get everything sorted out. Uh, 533, couldn't find exit code. This should be IL results. And 492 in the JIT will be a, as an I64. Okay, 290 not handled here. Here we'll say an aisle results trap uh, trap code. Print a VM exited with trap X trap code. And we'll have this panic as well temporarily. Okay. Is there somewhere you can read about this project? Yeah, I have a couple of blogs on it. Uh, so there's a there's a blog that you can find here and here.
Okay. And then finally, Vim exited with trap. So here we have uh, JIT exited with this, FFR online. Um, looks good. So yeah, it looks really good. So all those vectors up and running. Uh, those are kind of a return. Uh, no longer the return codes there. Uh, prints at the end here. Oops. Jit exited with this online. Okay. Oops. I did have that right. This was the wrong one. Okay. So now I have an exit code. I just need to convert that to the correct aisle results. So I'll do a match exit code. Then here I'll say an OX 47AB4123. This is a um, trap with RBX holding the trap uh, code. And then we're going to make RBX an output register. So this will be like exit value. And that's just going to be a general purpose value. And that's why I'm not giving it a specific name. RBX, we can get rid of the save restore of. And then up here, let this u64. I'm going to align these because it looks prettier. Uh, allocate room for outputs from the assembly. OK. RBX goes into the exit value. And then in the case of that, we're going to return an aisle result trap of exit value as u size. And uh, uh, the resulting online, so mask from raw as uh, u8. And here I can say uh, let resulting online is equal to mask from raw resulting online as u8. So now I can say resulting online. So I'm going to return out the tuple, which is the resulting online, and then the trap code, and then uh, panic unexpected exit code from JIT. This exit code here uh, from JIT. OK convert the resulting online mask into an actual mask structure. So now we get uh, ooh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. That looks like a seg fault to me. I'm doing something stupid. Um. Whoa. Uh, uh RBX. Uh oh yeah 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 wow, wow yeah because we're using that as the. Yep, so we're going to have to pop RBX. Here we'll do a push RBX. And instead, we'll put the trap information, we'll put it into R10. Ended up overriding my, uh, the, good, the good pointer. Okay, uh, VM exited with the trap OX1 hex. Of course, that is not correct anymore. Exit value, that should be coming from R10, and here it needs to go into R10. Okay, VM exited with trap dead, which is exactly what we want to see. So now... Uh, uh, trap. So when it does this, I think all I want to do is I think I just want to set online to zero. Um, 
So on a trap, I can do uh, self dot self dot online equals mask um, is equal to self dot online. What what did this do? This updated caused VM exit to here. So when we get a trap, we want to disable all of the VMs that. Uh, we want to set them to zero here. So we get the self dot online dot raw and it with uh, cause VM exit dot raw and it'll mask from this. And then we'll do, we'll invert that. Uh, and then this will be disable VMs which caused uh, VM exits. And this is, I think there's still gonna be an issue here, mask from. Expected type raw. Um, um. Expected. Uh, oh, from raw. About to say. Okay, so this is gonna have an issue because things are gonna get uh, rejoined here. Print VM exited with trap that. Uh, we can put a new line in there. From raw, online raw, cause VM exit raw. Okay, looks good. VM exited with trap dead. And then uh, while online is not all disabled, we'll go down here, uh, print exiting. Okay, so that's making it out of the loop. Uh, Vima exited with trap, we no longer need that. Uh, we can just underscore trap code. And that should be good. Okay, uh, need to update fast dirty remain. Uh, so to do that, we're gonna return out one other thing. Uh, we'll return back the fast dirty remain. So this we pass into R14 and we'll also get it back as well. Um, and we'll call this new fast dirty remain is the resulting R14. Then up here we'll do let this. Okay, and we don't save and restore that, so that should be good. So uh, print old remain this, new this, uh, fast dirty remain, new fast dirty remain. They should be the same number. Um, and then this will be uh, new fast dirty remain here. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Uh, uh, as you size. You know, we can actually just put that as a U size up here. Okay. Uh, 263. Incompatible type. Um, yep, 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 yep. Uh, let's. You know, I'm actually gonna pass in a thing. Uh, new fast dirty remain is equal to OU size. And this will be mutable. We pass in a mutable reference to this as an argument. Uh, gets the new fast dirty value uh, remain. And then this will be like get access to page table pointers, get the new fast dirty remain. That's gonna go in here. Uh, mute u size, no longer needs to return that. Uh, this is gonna be called ret fast dirty remain. And then we're going to fill in the new one with the ret.
Okay, so Rhett should be the local. Yep, Rhett is the local. Uh, update the fast, dirty remain. Uh, old remain that, new remain that. It's going to be equal to, we want to deref that. Okay, and then this is just a double tuple. Okay, that looks great. And now I just need some unsafe code in MMU. Uh, fast dirty pub fn update fast dirty mute self counts u size uh, update fast dirty remain. This is going to be a pub unsafe fn uh, update the fast dirty uh, remaining counts. So we'll do self.dirty remain is equal to counts. We'll assert that. Okay, so that should be fine. That'll set dirty remain. Fast dirty. Uh, get the current pointer. This will be uh, self.dirty remain. So we'll get a pointer to the remainder, the remainder there. And then here we're gonna update the dirty remain. And then down here, we'll set it back to max dirty. Uh, max. And what I wanna do here is uh, boop, boop, boop. set or update. Update fast dirty remain. This instead is going to be max dirty minus dirty remain. Is that what I want? Uh, dirty remain. This is actually what I want. And then uh, this will get subtracted from dirty remain will go back until it eventually hits zero, in which case it will return that address. Okay, that should be good. Fantastic. Okay. Okay, so we're getting some good perf stats from here, our reset times, our fuzz times, and our time spent uh, inside of the VM, um, and our fuzz cases per second. Obviously, we're not really fuzzing anything in this case, uh, but this is saying that we are... We're basically uh, setting up an initial state and then jumping into the state of the VM, running this JIT, uh, we're doing that 500,000 times per second, which is actually really good. Um, uh, like, if we were to say this was an internal loop, yeah, that's, that's really good. So now what I can do is, instead of one thread, I can just say 256 threads, and we can see if we scale out, and we should. Come on. There we go. So, why is that number dropping so fast? I'm trying to figure out if this number is dropping or if this number is approaching. I, I think the first number was just off. Yeah, I don't think the, um, the thread that was doing printing was up and running. Yeah, which caused it to have a, a different number. So this is saying that we are able to, uh, we we're, we're able to run this JIT a hundred million times per second. Um, let's see if I were to switch. So now we can play around with our JIT. Let's uh, let's put it to count to one load constant, uh, load loop constant, and we'll just set it to one right now. I just want to see like what this uh, scales out to in terms of. Uh... Okay, so what this is doing, this is now like basically benchmarking the reset speed of the VM. So like the maximum performance I could get 
because uh, we're effectively doing nothing. In fact, I, I could actually do nothing by, um, I could just do this temporarily. Uh, we'll return an okay of graph. So all we're going to do is we're going to emit uh, just a trap. So the JIT will just be literally just that like ret right away. So this is kind of getting a benchmark like how quickly we can spin up and reset these VMs. Um, and obviously it's pretty fast. So, and you know what, uh, for uptime, I actually want the uptime, I don't like when it estimates over, I want it to estimate under. I want it to grow up to a number, not grow down to a number. So to change that, um, I'm gonna find in uh, aisle session, um, and I'm also not updating the uh, uh, dirty thing. Let me, let me go add that quick before I forget. Um, so after we run the JIT, uh, enter JIT, after this, I'm going to want to do a let ret is equal to this. We're going to do ret, and then I'm going to do uh, unsafe uh, self.mmu.update fast dirty remain of the new fast dirty remain. Okay, so update the fast dirty state. Okay, unsafe, yeah, it's already in an unsafe block. That means we now fit on one line, woo! Okay, yep, looks good. And then we're not seeing the prints for a while, that's fine. So if we look at unaccounted, this print here, so we're going to go and spin up all those threads, and then we're going to start this timer. So here we're going to do start a timer. Uh, list of all threads be spawn. Uh, this is just going to spawn all the threads. And now uh, we're going to estimate that number down because we'll start the timer before we spin up the threads because we were including the time it would take to create all of those VMs. Uh, initially, which has a non-zero cost. Obviously, it's taking like a couple seconds here. In fact, I don't actually know why it's so slow. Um, but nevertheless, this number is now climbing. And it's at, yeah, 415 million per second. Uh, God, I fucking love this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> These numbers are just so stupid. <laughs> it's just so stupid. Like, unbelievable. Um, yeah, as we're already at 20 billion fuzz cases. Now, obviously, we're not like actually fuzzing or doing anything interesting. Um, man, the perf from this JIT actually looks really good compared to my last JIT. Uh... Yeah, 256 cores. Technically 64 cores, 256 threads. So 451 million fuzz cases per second. Uh, all of these metrics are telling me basically like how much time we're spending inside the VM and not. Um, so this is saying that we're spending most of our time inside the VM, which is uh, really healthy. Uh, we have some, like, a 4% reset cost, which makes sense because we're doing nothing in the VM. Um, but the fact that we're spending 89% of our CPU time in that VM, uh, even though we're only very quickly entering there, now we have the overhead of saving and restoring all this state, and that's what's really killing us right now. Um, so that's basically our bottleneck right now, is, is that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to find... Uh, insters. This is stats instructions and instructions. Uh, stats dot instructions, and I think I pass this into. Um, uh, number of guest uh, instructions, and I guess how do I get that during emulation? Let me just put it into emulation mode. We can see what it looks like in emulation mode, uh, how much of a perf 
difference there is. And in fact, this is gonna uh, fail because uh, unemulated trap. So let's uh, implement that quick. So I'll go into uh, folk IL source graph, uh, oops, IL graph emulator uh, trap. Okay, so we'll say on an IL ins trap, IL word uh, trap or trap code, this is going to return out with an IL result, if I'm not mistaken. Probably takes the exact same format we just wrote, a mask and an IL result. So this will take uh, online and then um, an IL result trap and the trap code as a U size. Okay, and that's already a U size, so we can actually just do uh, this. Uh, whoop. This? No. Fuck it. Okay. So now the emulator should be at parity for that. Okay, emulating trap. Uh, that's just because I have a print here. So that's saying like what the emulator is emulating. And... Okay. Yeah, I guess in this case, we're not really getting a speed up from the JIT because we're not really doing anything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into uh, emulate mode is true. And now uh, we're going to get rid of this immediate trap sort of stuff. And we're going to loop, we'll loop 100,000 times per, per iteration. So this will drop our iteration speed, of course. Um, but that's fine. So now we're going to see what this looks like with the emulation. So in emulation, we're getting uh, 13,000 a second, 14,000, probably, probably like 15,000 a second once that climbs up. Uh, that looks pretty good. Now, hopefully our JIT is faster than our emulator. <laughs> if it's not, I'm going to be really sad. Um, let's see. We went from 15,000, and now we're running, we shall see. Yeah, now we're running uh, uh, 800,000, actually probably about a million a second once it climbs. So yeah, that's a decent speed up over emulation. Um, not too bad. Yeah, what is that speed up factor? Let's say uh, a mil divided by 15,000. Only 66 times faster? I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. Is that really? Man, I, I wrote a really fast emulator if that's the case. Uh, lifting that. Let me see if it's, uh, it's, I guess we're not really running into overhead issues anymore. Um, let's put that to 10 mil. And let's see what we get. All right, this is at, now this is going to be spending all of the CPU time in that VM. And I guess our, our JIT is, is actually not in great shape yet. Uh, we've got a, a two loads that we can emit here that would really help with our perf. Um, but yeah, this is looking like it's at about 10K. And if we switch back to emulation mode, we'll see what this looks like. I mean, it is just a hot loop, so the emulator will perform really well here. Um, especially as it's not like thrashing the aisle registers. But let's say that was like 10K. And yeah, the emulator is getting ooh, 30. Oh, it's climbing. It's climbing. 100. Oh. Yeah, it looks like in the 100 ballpark. Yeah, so the shit's about 100X faster than the emulator. Um, it's weird that it like kind of jumps like that. Okay. 
So in this case, in our JIT, we were getting uh, in this case, in the JIT, we were getting uh, uh, let's say 10,000 iterations per second, and then let's say we're looping uh, 10 million times, and for each loop, we're doing what are we doing? We're doing uh, we're like we're doing an add and a compare and a branch. So let's say that's like three, equivalent to three instructions. So that's saying we're running like 300 billion instructions per second in the emulator. If we were to say that this inner loop is three instructions for a guest, which I think it is, you're, we're grabbing a register, we're adding one to it, we're comparing that with a lower value and then we're conditionally branching. So, uh, that perf actually looks much better than my old IL, which was, um, my old IL, well, I guess this is not like, so what I can do is I can like unroll this a little bit. So all of this is loop overhead here. This is all loop. So what I could do is in my IL, I could do like a couple ads. So I could basically, uh, uh, simulate like doing a, a bunch of ads. So I'll do, um, we'll just do this a, a bunch and we just need to propagate this. And I, I don't think my optimizer is smart enough right now to uh, constant propagate these uh, through each other. Um, or I guess this isn't even constant propagation. This is like reduction. So I don't think I handle that at all. That's at 12, 13. Okay, this is now at 16. So we're gonna get A, we're gonna add one to it, we're gonna take the results and we're gonna add one, we're gonna do that 16 times, then we're gonna loop. Okay, so I wanna see roughly what this does for perf, and it's probably exactly the same as before, effectively. I'm really impressed with our emulator speeds. So now I'm gonna just basically say that we're doing 16 arithmetic operations uh, per loop. And even that's a little low with our, our loop overhead. So let's say I'm doing, uh, uh, is that going faster now? Um, oh yeah, cause that's updating our, our loop count. Uh, yeah, so this is basically tracking the number of additions we perform and it's doing, it's doing 10 million additions per loop. If we do this, so I want to make this a, a an even par of 16. So we'll do like that many. So it will loop a million times on the inside. And that should be good. That's building and deploying, right? Yeah, compiled, optimized, pushed. Okay. So now we can say that this is doing per iteration... This is doing this many adds, and then we can just multiply this number directly by our number of iterations per second. And it looks like it's probably like 40, 42,000. Let's say 41,000, because we will cross that for sure. So yeah, this is doing 687 billion adds per second, which is pretty good. Still not great. Actually, no, that's really good. That's really good. The theoretical maximum for this processor is uh, uh, 1.1 billion, which is the, the tick rate of the processor multiplied by 64 cores. This is the number of... Uh, cycles per uh, second and then I can multiply that by I'm doing eight add operations eight 64-bit add operations per cycle and then we can do two of those vector instructions per cycle so theoretical number is this on the processor of like perfect full speed and we're running at uh, we're running at 61% of theoretical maximum throughput for this processor. And that's even with low numbers because now it's at 43,000. Um, 
and that's our full loop that's including the overhead of resetting the vm and everything which obviously our overhead is fucking tiny because we're running at almost 100 percent cpu time inside the vm uh but we could we could up this number even more um and you know what i'm gonna take these we're gonna bank them we're gonna add one more i'm just unrolling a bit more I think this should emit, this should basically hit theoretical max throughput uh, when it's unrolled here. Um, okay, all the way through 32 ads. Uh, let's see. I'll drop this back down to this. Okay. So now we're doing this many ads per iteration. And then we'll see what this converges to. I'm guessing it looks like 20... 24,000. Yeah, just unrolling gets us a lot, especially on this processor. This processor, a branch, is like the end of the world. So unrolling is critical. I'm just waiting for this number to grow. I think it's probably safe to say 25,000 is reasonable here. I think we'll I think we'll crest 25,000. So this is now doing 838 billion instructions per second, or in this case, ads per second, um, which is really good. Because keep in mind, we're writing scalar code. We are, we are literally, we're like taking scalar things and making them vectorized um, to get a speed up over native. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty cool. So let's drop it down to a single thread and let's, let's look at how this compares with native execution of scalar code. So scalar, we're running this number. So we're taking, we take this. We're gonna multiply this by, uh, looks like 130. Yeah, so this is, this is saying we are running, yeah. Yeah, this is saying right now on a single thread, on a single core, in fact, that isn't even accurate because we said 130. It looks like it's more gonna be like 135, more likely. Yeah. So we're going to take uh, this number, multiply it by 135. And this is saying we are running, we are emulating 4.5 billion instructions per second uh, on a single thread. And if we take a look at our processor um, here, Uh, you'll see that the processor that we're running on is a 1.3 gigahertz processor. So, so yes, we're, that code is running about, uh, about twice the speed of native execution. Um, obviously we're not lifting the actual x86 we're running, but if we lifted it, it would emit to exactly that code. Um, it, it wouldn't be hard to write a lifter that would generate this when you... If, if I were to write x86, that would load EAX and then add one to it 32 times, and then it would write it out to EAX, and then it would do a branch on it, I could easily lift directly to this. So it doesn't. I don't need a high-quality lifter to get to that point. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, uh, this processor can dispatch uh, uh, two ads per cycle. So at 1.3 gigahertz, this processor is able to 
uh, it would be able to do uh, 2.6 billion ads per second. So we're running about uh, 1.74 times faster than the native execution of the processor. Um, and that is the magical thing about vectorized emulation, <laughs> is that we can lift code. So like if this were MIPS, right? We're, we're basically emulating when we're running on all cores. Um, when we're em running on all cores, we're emulating like a, a, a technically not one, but we're, we're emulating like 850 billion MIPS instructions per second, which uh, we're running, how many VMs are we running? We're running uh, 2,048 VMs. So it basically means on a single machine, we would be uh, emulating uh, 850, we'd be emulating uh, 2,048, 415 megahertz MIPS processors, effectively, is what this is capable of doing. And this is half the speed of my prior vectorized emulation stuff, because my prior vectorized emulation work was 32 bits, and the modern stuff is 64 bits. It's just better, but it means my theoretical speed is halved. But luckily, since you're doing most stuff with memory accesses, it doesn't really matter. The, like, these numbers that we're looking at right now, where we're going through and doing these hot, like, arithmetic loops, these are, like, best case scenarios. Of course, in these situations, we're going to have half the performance uh, of a 32-bit version. But, um, well, unless we're doing 64-bit operations, in which case we'll be much faster because it won't have to do a, an add with carry uh, chain. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy with this. I need to get the MMU stuff plumb, plumbed in. I actually have an MMU implementation already done in JIT. I just have to JIT that out and have that accessed. Um, but that's pretty much ready to go. I can just pl plop that in. That'll take probably 15 minutes. Uh, could you explain how would vectorizing things speed up the computation? Effectively, when you're running Scalar, you're performing like, in this case, you'd perform like 32 ads in a row. But with vectorized stuff, I would be performing, once again, 32 ads in a row. In fact, I can pull up the, um, let me pull up the, uh, let's see. When we do a JIT update, I'll say if true, I'll do a, uh, we'll do a standard FS write to mount D uh, assembly dot bin of the IL uh, global JIT dot backing. So this is just going to be write out the JIT to disk for inspection. Uh, JIT mem. Look, okay, I'll source JIT helpers. And then we just want to get uh, backing here is yeah, we don't want to expose it. Uh, we'll do uh, pub fn backing self. This will return a static u8 reference. Actually, we won't lifetime it. We'll just say uh, self.backing. Uh, return out a reference. In fact, we're going to explicitly say this. I want to downgrade that reference to the uh, backing memory. And here we'll do self.backing. Okay, and that's just complaining here because uh, still borrowed for uh, create asm there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we're at 2.46 here. Asm and base. I feel like I moved that up earlier, and I'm not sure why again. So let's see if I can do that, if I can scope it. I can't. Base not found in this scope. Uh, yeah, because base is created here. Okay. So then we'll do that. I mean, here's what we can do. We can just do uh, 
uh, and drop asm. Just drop that reference, and we'll just do this. Uh, dot expect failed to write out assembly block. Okay. Okay, so that's gonna fail, of course. Uh, but when we run it locally, this will work, and then it'll get a illegal instruction. But that's fine because it should be dumped out. So now I can go into uh, uh, open. Here we'll just uh, new tab, open this. Here's the JIT that we generated. Create a new function here. So here's the the JIT that we're actually running. So, um, in fact, this. Holy shit, that's actually running faster than I would expect. No, this is definitely running at max throughput because there's a dependency here. Because the the last uh, add depends on the prior one. And due to this dependency chain here, um, it can't do two per cycle. It can only do one per cycle, uh, which means that we're we're actually at the theoretical maximum. We're, we're literally just maxing out this processor with our JIT. Um, obviously, this JIT is fantastic. Like, you can't get much better than this uh, for cleanliness. Obviously, this could be moved to a, a post DOM or a, a, to a dominator. This could be moved to a dominator, and then the update of it could be moved to a post DOM. These have to re uh, remain here. Um, but everything else looks really good in this uh, JIT. So, I like that a lot. But effectively, the reason we can speed things up compared to native execution is that if we had native execution here, you would do a bunch of ads in a row. You'd do 32 ads in a row, and they would perform an ad on a single 64-bit register and update a 64-bit register, and you'd be done. But in this case, these vector-packed ad quad words are actually doing eight 64-bit ads at a time. So this means that we're emulating eight different virtual machines, eight different whatever you want to call it, VMs, hardware, NESs, like whatever we're emulating, we're emulating eight at a time per hardware thread. And that means that we're able to do eight operations per instruction compared to the traditional one, um, barring some exceptional instructions. But this basically allows us to get like a theoretical 8x speed up. It's not quite that perfect because normal scalar instructions are traditionally faster. Um, like a scalar ad, you can do, uh, well, on modern x86, you can do four ads per cycle. But on um, vectorized, you can only do two per cycle, even on like the latest gen Skylake AVX 512 cores. Um, it's pipelining it? No, it's just parallelizing it. We're not making one really fast VM. We're making many fast. We're, we're not making one extremely fast VM. We're making many fast VMs. Um, I have no interest in making something super fast scalar. It's just, it's pointless. I'm trying to fuzz. I want to get as many, as many different cases through this as I possibly can. So, but this JIT is looking to be in really good shape. Um... Yeah, there there are a couple warts uh, like on this on this version when we lifted some MIP stuff, we're thrashing memory a little bit more than we need to, but it just honestly it doesn't really matter too much on the Xeon Phi because you're with four-way hyperthreading, you'll just stall your thread while another thread goes active. So yeah, obviously it would be probably like a twenty or thirty percent speed up if we reduced all of these uh, loads and stores. And that is something that I'll eventually get to doing. That's going to be like a two-hour... Uh, actually, that's probably going to be like a day-long optimization pass. It's going to be relatively complex, uh, very dangerous optimization pass where I'll have to be really careful, have good tests. Um, but yeah, this, uh, this JIT's looking phenomenal. Um, I'm really happy with this. The fact that it just emits a block of ads... Uh, makes me really happy here. So yeah. But I think that's where I'm going to call it for the night. Um, obviously, I have a lot more work to do. Um, I want to write this optimization pass at some point. I need to finish up the JIT and the IL. There are a couple instructions I haven't implemented yet. Just 
This is a, a new JIT that I've been working on. It's a lot cleaner. It's graph-based compared to the previous one, which was block-based. Um, it just, it's a whole new set of problems, so I'm kind of going at it incrementally. Uh, but now that we're here, I'm going to basically finish up this JIT, and then I think I'll probably start working on like a 6502 emulator on stream. Uh, and it's kind of silly because my IL is 64 bits, so we'll be emu emulating like an 8-bit processor or a 16-bit, I guess it's an 8-bit uh, processor with 16-bit memory um, on a 64-bit IL. So it will like be four times slower than it theoretically could be. Uh, but we're going to get to do some pretty crazy things there. So that's eventually where we'll uh, uh, get to. So... Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you, Pizza Belly, for following. And Psychologix. Psych. Psycholog. Cycloglitch. Thank you for following. And Joe's Monkey Land. I think I missed that one as well. Thank you so much. This was a, a blast of a stream. Uh, pretty laid back. Nothing in here was too stressful. Uh, I think everything went as planned. I don't think there was anything that we had to debug in this stream. Um, and that's that's what I really like about this this new architecture. I'm, I'm being very careful with this code to make it very clean. Like the fact that I can change the number of threads by just changing this number uh, makes me really happy. So everything's looking really good in this uh, new IL. I like... I mean, this is a this is like a 130 line of code implementation of a quote unquote new architecture um, that gets vectorized out, and all you have to worry about is scalar. You don't have to, as a developer of a lifter, you don't have to worry about the actual vectorization and all of that complexity. All you have to do is just write your scalar stuff, and it figures it out under the hood for you. So, um, yeah, yeah, every, everything we did today was based around this. 130 lines of code, which was, I mean, 64 lines of those, or 32 lines of that code is, is just this ad unrolled. And honestly, we're pretty, pretty verbose with spaces here that we don't need. So yeah, looks really cool. I love this new, uh, IL architecture. I need to improve things on it, but thanks for tuning in. See you around.